Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. And this episode, I have the honor and privilege of talking with the legendary Lee Jessen. Lee is an American social psychologist, distinguished professor, and chair of the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University. Lee has been on the front lines of doing research on social perception, stereotypes, bias for over 30 years, and is widely published within the scientific journals. In this conversation, we talk about much of his research, um, both historically and, and at present. Um, we start the conversation talking about an explanation of scientific data on stereotypes. Um, usually people think kind of colloquially of stereotypes as negative things, and there definitely are negative stereotypes. But we talk about where it comes from out of academia, specifically from social psychology, and then how that um, translates to out in the real world of how that's perceived and some of the differences. We talk about the um, identity between reality and the world and then people's beliefs about that reality and how we understand stereotypes. We talk about some of the bad stereotypes, where they come from and how one understands, you know, different stereotypes. We didn't get, a, we get a little bit in the, in the weeds in kind of a, a geeky kind of way about replication crisis, which I've talked about on the podcast before. And we talk about pre-registration for uh, um, scholarly journal entries. We talk about social psych studies historically and how they were conducted and how they are now more currently. Um, we talk about some of the reasons why replication studies are hard to publish. Um, and then we, we start talking about social perception and then bias. And so we have a nice bit in here about you know, the differences between explicit bias, which is usually easier to kind of see and, and know. And then we talk about implicit bias, which is, you know, quite uh, popular these days and it's used in the vernacular of many people. Um, we, we give a really nice, I think, segment on what, what the kind of core problem is with implicit bias. Um, I don't think Lee or myself deny that there could be implicit bias. I think the problem that we have and we detail in the conversation is there's not a general acceptable definition of implicit bias. And in fact, Lee um, shares with, with some of the research that he's done and some of the stuff he's published, the, the varying definitions of implicit bias, and they're all very different. And so we talk about that and, and, under, and how we understand, you know, how are we exploring and understanding implicit bias if we can't have an agreed upon definition for one? Um, we talk about the history a little bit, or Lee does, about the social psychology's research ideas and how this kind of connects with implicit bias as just another, you know, epoch, if you will, within social psych uh, research. Um, we didn't get into the implicit association test, the IAT, which is, again, it's very common. A lot of people have heard about this now. And he's done a lot of work on the IAT. Um, he uses it in, in research. Um, so, you know, I think we give a very charitable um, reading of the IAT and its use and some of the dangers of using it so quickly um, within society. Um, Lee's also done some really good research early on on self-fulfilling prophecies. And so he gives a few comments about that. And then towards the end of the conversation, he talks about how he became more of an activist for academia. I mean, again, Lee's been in academia for at least 30 years. And, you know, that's kind of home for him. That's, that's his, his world. And, you know, we want to maintain the integrity and neutrality and objectivity of, of academia. And he feels very passionately about that, as do I. And so he kind of shares um, his, his approach of trying to maintain those uh, principles. Um, and we talked about a whole other assortment of, of topics as well. Lee is fantastic. He has, you know, such just vibrant energy. He's a very genial man. He is extremely brilliant. And again, as I said in the beginning, I felt really fortunate and uh, honored to have him on the podcast. So without further delay, I bring you Lee Jussum. I am here with the legendary Lee Jussum. Lee, how's it going? 
Uh, it's good, Xavier. How, how, how you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited for you to come on. Um, we've we've uh, messaged each other and everything, and so you know, obviously, I I've read your work, and uh, you know, you have so much to offer and tell us, both historically and and uh, from your work historically and and currently. So I'm excited to get your thoughts and your insights and your wisdom. So. Um, well, I really, I mean, I really appreciate that. That is incredibly sweet. They, 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 I mean, we basically met on Twitter, right? We never met before Twitter. Yeah, no, no, right? not right? Yeah. It's one of the yeah, online yeah. kind of meeting. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, because Twitter has a well-justified reputation as a cesspool where, right. you know, people just fight and hurl insults at each other. And that is like basically correct. There's nothing that, wrong yes, with that. That is but, correct. But, <laughs> but it is correct. Yeah, it's basically correct. But it, but in addition to that, it has right. stuff like this where yeah. you meet oh, yeah. people you find really interesting and 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 are just worth having known that you wouldn't have otherwise known. Right. And, you right. know, it, it's great that way. And, you yeah. know, and the other the other side of that for me. It, it, it for me, it's an end around academia. It uh -huh. is it is a a way to directly be in touch with people out in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now let's you know let the best ideas win. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. So tell for for listeners who don't know who you are, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Just kind of historically, um, what your your research is in, what your kind of uh, what your area of the world has been in, and, and what you're doing now. Yeah, so um, I'm a social psychologist. I've been at Rutgers my entire career, which I arrived there in 1987. So it's a long time. I'm also chair of the department, which I've been for the last like two and a half years, which is my second go round. Um, I done it earlier, 2000. Right. So, 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 there's, so there's something about me. Like the last time I was chair was right after the 2008 2009 crash. And now I'm chair right after the COVID crash. Right. So, so it's like budgetary hell has broken out everywhere. And people are trying to cope. In addition to all the COVID stuff, everybody, in addition, we're coping with budget hell. Um, my, uh, my research for much of my career that I am still doing, I think of it as on the relations between social beliefs and social reality. So it's one thing to study what people make of the world. It's another to try and link that to, well, you know, is the world, how well does the world correspond to what they believe? Mm -hmm. And that's a step that few psychologists take. Mm -hmm. um, and if, not none, I'm not the only one who's done that, but it's few and far between, actually. Um, uh, so... And, and that, my, a lot of my early work was on self-fulfilling prophecies and mm -hmm. stereotypes and biases and all, all that sort of stuff. And I'm still doing a lot of that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but about 10 years ago, I mean, to me, it's part of the same subset of interests. Like, what are the relationships between belief and reality when... when the replication crisis hit psychology. Yeah. One way to think about that was that psychological claims about psychology, about people, were actually not well connected to the reality. Because if they were well connected to the reality, we would have, you know, it, we wouldn't have a replication crisis. They'd hold it up. would be yeah. relatively easy to, right. it would hold up. Yeah, exactly. Right. So to me, you know, I mean, it's been framed as the replication crisis, but it is really a subset of the relationship between belief and reality. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then as I was doing this work, you know, sometimes data, as far as I can tell, the general principle is data on politicized topics, uh, uh, topics that gets people's sort of political juices flowing. Sometimes they get angry or they go rah, 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 whatever they're going to do. That, that that kind of work um, doesn't, with any regularity, consistently um, confirm uh, either left-wing or right-wing narratives. But sometimes it kind of supports views on the left. Sometimes it kind of supports views on the right. Sometimes it's kind of neither, or it's complex and mixed and nuanced. Sometimes it's actually kind of centrist. It's like, well, this kind of weird mix. I mean, it's just all over the political map. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that um, work that seems to confirm right-wing type narratives uh, runs into 
you know, all sorts of obstacles and basically, you know, hellish obstructions mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in social science. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like, that was a strange experience when I first stumbled on it, like kind of in the early 2000s or so, it was when I first, like, what is this? What is going on? I thought, like the data are the data, the data are better than those data. So like, what, you know, what is this? How is it, you know, like, okay, yeah, it's confirming some narrative you don't like, but it's like the damn data. And sometimes it's the data published in some of the best journals, actually, right. sometimes. Yeah. So, so, um, so that was a weird experience. And that led me to two, two related things. One is to become interested in political psychology more general. That is how do people's political beliefs influence bias and dis distort their perceptions yeah. of reality. And the subset of that, how do social scientists' political beliefs lead them to distort the social science? So, yeah. you know, so and that actually connects with the science reform stuff, so stuff trying to improve the methods and practices to make the field more valid. It's just to me, it's the same, uh, it's all under the same topic of how do we get scientists' claims to conform more closely to the evidence that they have oh, that's, a, that's a really nice way in which you're putting it because it all and how you describe it i can see like the the yeah. thread that goes yeah. with all of it right it's yeah. like well how do we understand reality and then how do we understand you know individuals beliefs about reality and then yeah. you're just looking at different subsets of that how do we understand yeah. with our yeah. biases how do we understand that yeah. with uh, political affiliations etc so i can see the, yeah. the through line there and all that that's great yeah um yeah. Okay, so so maybe give us a, a a primer, if you will, on. Uh, I mean, obviously you can't, you know, summarize or talk about <laughs> in an hour or so all of your data, but maybe kind of give us a primer on um, stereotypes and person perception and things of that nature historically, and then we'll we'll get into all the really juicy stuff a little bit later. But um, my so I mean, I my doctorate's in clinical psych, so you know we had to take a, a little bit of some social psych courses and. My third reader on my dissertation was a social psychologist. So I, uh, I, I've hung out with you folk a little bit. So <laughs> you guys are great. You know <laughs> that super well. <laughs> you people. You, you you people. Hung around with you. <laughs> I love social psychologists. They're great. They're, they're the smarties uh, for in our, in our field. Uh, are... Some of my best friends are social psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I have a little bit of, of some knowledge here. So, so kind of tell us just about, um, just, I guess, in general, you know, kind of stereotypes or however you want to break it down about how we understand reality or how we understand beliefs about yeah. it, however you want to do it. So, so stereotypes are actually very hard to talk about clearly mm -hmm. because the term is so embedded in natural discourse as a term of derogation and dismissal. Right. So, and so that makes it really very hard to have uh, any kind of scientific discussion about stereotypes that doesn't implicitly import an assumption that what you're talking about is something rigid, irrational, um, and unjustified. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So you can't, so, so then you're, if you're going to address these issues, you're faced with a very difficult choice. One is to come up with, an, to uh, say, okay, stereotypes are belief, people's beliefs about groups that are inaccurate, irrational, they're drenched in prejudice, they, you know, they, they you know, uh, they, they advance the patriarchy and white supremacy, and that's, you know, that's what they, they justify, you know, oppression and inequality, and, and that's fine, that you could do that. Mm -hmm. the, and, and that is what people will hear most of the time. But if, if that's what you're doing from a scientific standpoint, then you have to do something else with beliefs that don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it, uh, you know, you, you, there's this sort of knee-jerk assumption that any belief about groups is a stereotype. So, you, you know, and the easiest way to dismiss any claim about groups is to say that's just a stereotype. But you know, I'm pretty sure on average, men are taller than women. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, is that a stereotype? Well, that depends on how you define a stereotype. If right. you define a stereotype as unjustified, irrational, drenched in pe uh, uh, prejudice, and, and, and something that helps sustain the patriarchy and oppression, well, then it's not a stereotype. Mm -hmm. And if it's not a stereotype, well, what is it? 
Mm -hmm. Now, you could have some like, well, it's, you know, a, a belief about, about and which compares demographic groups. You could define it, something like that. Um, but then, you know, it's like, what, then you have to repeat that sentence every time you're talking about it, because otherwise people won't know what you're talking about. So it'd be good to have like a single word, like stereotype. So what would you call it? You could invent a word, like an accutype. You, like I've thought about this, right? Mm -hmm. But no one would know what you were talking about if you referred to an accutype. So, so that's okay. So the, the only, so the other option is to actually talk about or write about stereotypes and, and, um, and then either be really clear that you're only talking about things that are irrational and justified and, and steeped in prejudice, or that you remove this, the pejoratives from the definition right. and say, well, you're just talking about beliefs about groups. Right. Now that's sort of a bad, that's also a bad, they're both bad options. And here's why they're both bad options. If you, if you start with the traditional belief that stereotypes are inaccurate, unjustified, exploitative, all this sort of bad, evil stuff, you have to first show that a belief has those characteristics before you can identify that belief as a stereotype. The specific belief or beliefs in general, as, as they're inherent to, to this? Well, it, it, if it's, if, just let's uh, let, let's back up a little bit. Okay. If pneumonia is chest congestion caused by bacteria, then if you have chest congestion caused by a virus, you don't have pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that the chest congestion was caused by bacteria if you define pneumonia as chest congestion caused by bacteria. If all you have is chest congestion, you don't know whether you have pneumonia or not. Right. Okay, that logic is identical to stereotypes. If you define stereotypes as irrational and inaccurate, you have to first demonstrate that a belief is inaccurate before you can say you're examining or, or discussing a stereotype. But that's not what happens. That, right? so this is the problem. So you have this default assumption that stereotypes are inaccurate, and then people go talking about stereotypes without any evidence of their accuracy either way. I mean, they may be right, they may be wrong, but almost no one I've ever talked to knows the evidence that bears on the accuracy of people's beliefs about groups, including social scientists. So right. if you define it as inaccurate, they're all having incoherent conversations. Yeah. yeah. Now, if they don't define it as, and I don't define them as inaccurate, I find them really straightforward as beliefs about groups. But then the problem I have is for, if I'm talking about, well, say we're going to examine, and especially if you do sort of controversial stereotypes, stereotypes about men versus women, or blacks versus whites, or rich versus poor, or gays versus straights, any like these sort of hot button stereotypes. If you conclude anything other than they are steeped in prejudice, irrational tools of propaganda and exploitation, you risk, you are at high risk of being denounced and viewed as the worst kind of racist, you know, clan adjacent, you know, 21st century Nazi. Right. So there's just, there's no, there's really no good way to do it. So, so, so basically, <laughs> and how we understand it in current society is that we've, I'm not sure the origins of this, but stereotypes have this kind of, you know, spooky, pernicious, yeah. you know, evil kind of way of like, you know, that's a stereotype. And it's always, from, based on what you're saying, it's always operating from a negative framing, but you're positing that if you're trying to make a negative framing, you first have to understand the frame. And if right. you're only, you can see it negatively, but that doesn't mean that it's the, the negativity, whatever, or whatever negative valence you're putting on it is endogenous to the idea, right? You could have a stereotype that could be negative or positive, or it just is. And so to operate, you know, kind of absolutely, if you was, stereotypes are bad, the end is kind of missing at least half the picture and doesn't even really give you context for understanding it because you, you're, how can you judge something as, negative if you don't even understand the frame to begin with something like that right 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 i mean i mean in some ways i'd make it keep it really more simple it, it, this is not a problem in non-politicized topics and this is like so obvious that 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 at, once i laid out it'll be obvious 
I think, that it's the politics mm. that gets in the way of this sort of simple understanding. Anytime you want to know whether a, a person's belief or prediction is accurate, what you do is really straightforward. Get them to commit to a prediction, figure out what the criteria is, and compare the two. It's really simple. It's super, it's unbelievably simple. So if I say, you know, tomorrow is going to have a, 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 a high temperature of 60 degrees, uh, you know, give me a range. Maybe it'll be between 58 and 62. How would you figure out if that was right? You would compare that prediction to the high temperature tomorrow. Now, if it's 59, then I was right. If it's 49, I was not right. It's really simple. This is just not hard. But if you do it with, say, people's beliefs about um, likelihood of being arrested for a crime, likelihood of completing college or high school, um, uh, uh, likelihood of of being born out of wedlock, you know, I, I mean, any of these sort of hot controversial things, um, you know, scores on SAT tests or GREs, right? Any of these things, th th then all of a sudden, like all this stuff comes in that just makes it just unduly complicated. Now, th there are more, look, so the, the social, and these sort of measures of social and human characteristics are fuzzier than measuring temperature. Mm -hmm. right. So that is not a ridiculous criticism of work that attempts to compare that. So, you know, the GREs and the SATs are not equivalent to the idea of intelligence. They're related to intelligence in some way that requires a sort of logical, what some people call a derivation chain, uh, and it's contestable. That's completely reasonable to contest it. Um, uh, but that's but but the fundamental idea is is actually really quite simple. Hmm. How I just have a question here. So if it's too off the topic, you can you can stop me. But how is this how within this idea of stereotypes? How is this different from uh, heuristics and or cognitive biases? Right, because they, right. I start to see some convergence here of of these yeah. these, these ideas. Yeah, so I heard through back channels that a very famous social psychologist said, and didn't say this to me, but a, to, a, as per this discussion, someone I know pretty well, mm -hmm. that the, you know, I've been doing the stuff on stereotype accuracy and bias and self fulfilling prophecy for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and this, but that the stuff on stereotype accuracy probably would have gotten more traction if instead of calling it stereotype accuracy, I had called it the Bayesian brain. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and th I think that that point is probably well taken. Mm -hmm. it, well, so you're not saying this, but I do, I just want to ask about this is that there are bad stereotypes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We just, <laughs> we, we uh, just uh, about a month or two ago, maybe a couple of months ago, um, uh, I'm, now affiliated with this Network Contagion Research Institute, which studies disinformation and conspiracy theories all percolating online and, you know, in both conventional social media like Facebook and Twitter, but also sort of the dark corners, the, ch the chans and parlor mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we have this report on anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. You know, and, and, you know, percolating in these places are just these like evil, you know, these memes, the versions of the protocols of the elders in Zion kind of updated, you know. So, yeah, absolutely, of course, of course, I, I, you know, th the issue is not that stereotypes are necessarily rational or accurate. I mean, that would be ridiculous also, but it is an empirical question. You know, which means sort of goes back to my original opening point in response to your like, well, what, what do you do? The so data, data sometimes confirms left wing narratives and shows people mm -hmm. stereotypes are really kind of wildly out of touch with reality and probably linked to prejudice or something like it. And other times they're really kind of nicely in touch with reality, no matter how much, you know, wants to point to the patriarchy and white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. So so what do we. So how do we, how, what's a good understanding then of stereotypes, right? Because obviously this is kind of imported from academia and then it kind of feels like it gets, you know, put out through the wash and it, you know, in society, it just becomes, you know, this big evil thing. How do, how, what's a, a healthy way or a good way of understanding, you know, 
ideas we have about groups of folks or groups of well, people. Okay. Right, okay. So uh, to me, it's really important to distinguish what people actually think, mm. what actual people actually think from like television commercials, mass media, you know, movie characters. Mm. So, you, I mean, it's reasonable to critique those as stereotypes, sometimes as, as stereotypic in the nasty pejorative sense, in the pernicious sense. Um, uh, and, and that's fine. I mean, that's just, that's, you know, that's essentially, you know, it's content analysis and it's kind of attempts to reveal hidden and sometimes nasty assumptions underlying anything, whether it's, you know, the 1950s or 60s commercials, which pretty much all depicted women as happy housewives, right. you, you know, right? I mean, that's a classic case and stuff. And uh, uh, so there's lots of lots, lots of others like that. Um, uh, but that, you know, that tells you, I mean, it's not even clear what that tells you. It tells you, mm -hmm. if it's a commercial, it tells you what the ad writers think is going to sell product. That's what it tells you. Right. Now, you know, yeah, they're probably sociopaths. If they think advancing a stereotype will help sell product, they're probably going to do that, right? If they think, right, there's the recent, what, what was it? Was it the, the Nike commercials? The, 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 the toxic masculinity commercials, exactly. I don't know, right? Yeah, right? Exactly. So if they think, if they think, you know, rejecting stereotypes is going to help sell product, they're going to reject the stereotype. <laughs> yeah, right, right? So they'll do, they'll, you know, they're sociopaths. There was, I saw, I, I tweeted this, I don't know, about two or three months ago. Lululemon, you know, the uh -huh. women's yeah. clothing, yep, yep. tweets this anti-capitalist rant. Uh -huh. It's Lululemon. It's like the company's <laughs> worth tens of millions of dollars. They're in the business of making profit, right? But because they're sociopaths. They, they will say absolutely anything. And I'm not, when I say they, I don't just mean Lululemon. I mean right. the right. entire capitalist advertising network, which, you know, it's like I realize this is how the game is played. I'm not really complaining about it. Right, right, right. What I am saying is this tells you nothing about what regular people think. That That's that's my point. So, so, so you can't assume just because advertisements say this, that, or the other thing, or political cartoons display, you know, whatever, who, whatever group you're interested in, in sort of a negative way. None of that tells you what people think. So if you want to make a statement about what, uh, um, whether and how much people's prejudice infuses their stereotypes, whether the stereotypes themselves are accurate or not, rational or irrational, you have to study people. You can't study movies and, 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 and commercials. Right. Yeah. Right. So I guess my first question would be, in your mind, how do we study people then? Just in a general, in a general sense, how do we accurately study people? <laughs> I know it's a hard question. Yeah, well, that is a hard question, right? I mean, look, that's what the social sciences, at their best, that's what the so social sciences, the thing that underlies social science is studying people, you know, and you're aspiring to do it well. But what, what the, I, I would say two things about that. Um, what the replication crisis in psychology and ground zero for that is really social psychology. I mean, it has infected some of the other areas, but but it has probably the, been the most severe in social psych, which is the most social sciency of mo of the main areas of 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 psychology. So, I mean, there's lots of, you know, there's like this little art, this peace psychology. And, you know, I'm not talking really about these arcane little, little air, things that could be construed as areas. But, you know, when I think of the main areas where you have cognitive psychology, you have cl clinical, uh, the clinical psychology, you have neuroscience, you have organizational psychology. And then I, I, mean, I may be missing one or two, but those are really the main areas. Yeah. Um, so, and, and social is really closer, much closer to the social sciences. So, um, and so what the replication crisis has shown is that we are nowhere near as good at measuring what people think, feel, and do as we once thought. Mm -hmm. So it turns out to be like a very good and not easily answerable question. However, in the case of stereotypes, it, I think it's both easy and not easy. And it depends mm -hmm. on what you ask about. Yeah. So if you ask about people's beliefs for which there are very good criteria, like census data. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, is the census perfect? No, but it's pretty good. It's, it's pretty much, you know, I, I would say it's a gold standard. So um, if, if you're asking about 
uh, differences between groups in their educational ach achievement, in their income, in their wealth, in their occupational distributions. You know, this is like normal stuff that's in the census. It's really easy. You, you go to people, you ask them, you know, what proportion of, you know, come up with whatever groups you want to study that are in this, they have to be groups that are in the census. And one, one of the big things that's lacking in the census are religious groups because, you know, separation of church and state, so they don't touch it with the 10 foot pole. Um, so it has to be in there, but if it's in there, so then you ask people what they think, now you have what they think, you compare it to the census data, and it either corresponds well or it doesn't. That, that's it. It's empirical. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's like the Nazis are not involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I, I guess in, in that way, then, like, I, just to go back to the stereotypes, you know, kind of you were saying, like, you know, uh, advertisers in the 50s or in the 80s or what, whichever, you know, pick your pick your decade. Those do come from somewhere, though. Right, those kind of negative stereotypes. They come from somewhere, right? I don't think there's just a bunch of, you know, ad men, you know, just pulling it out of a hat <laughs> in a board meeting, right? I mean, they do come from somewhere. And, you know, okay, you could you can make a you can make a moral attribution and say, shame on them for just enforcing bad stereotypes. Fine. But I mean, they do come from somewhere in the world, yeah. So yeah, I you know. With, with, I mean, ads really vary, right? I mean, I, listen, I mean, the, one of the reasons you had first wave feminism was because most women were kind of relegated to the housewife role. Right. Now, from the ad standpoint, you know, if you want to sell detergent, you target the women, you don't target the, the men. So yeah, there is a sort of rational, sort of grounded reality in that. Uh, but you know, part of the critique is that, that those ads then reinforce these stereotypes and kind of have these sort of negative effects and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but, but your other point is well taken. And it's that people, or at least the way I think about it is this, lay people are not social scientists. You know, right. They don't walk around and data. They're not reading peer-reviewed journals. Most people have probably never opened up the census data, which is online. Right. I mean, just like there's no reason to expect, you know, a lawyer or a cab driver or an elementary school teacher, you know, or a cafeteria worker to do any of that. Like they might, like depending on what they do, they might. But there's just no reason to expect or demand or presume that they're supposed to do anything like that. Okay, so... So for a person walking around in the world, just sort of observing the world, like not even purposely, um, but you know, if you're around in the world, you see things, you see good neighborhoods, you see bad neighborhoods, you see clean streets, you see dirty yeah. streets, you see large houses, you see you know, uh, crowded apartment buildings, just like as a person wandering around the world, you'll probably see some of these things. Like you're not like trying to see them, you're like on your way somewhere else, but you sort of can't miss it sometimes, right? Okay. So, so such, such a this hypothetical person who is not studying this stuff is probably going to reach conclusions to, uh, that are linked to groups if the things being observed are linked to groups in some way. Mm -hmm. That is, social reality is likely to have some, as opposed to no, effect on how a person perceives the world. Now, it may not be the only thing. There may be other things that affect. Now, let, let's say um, a hypothetical person, uh, you know, proceed, you know, sort of drives on a long drive you know, that, that goes through both affluent neighborhoods and sort of poor inner city neighborhoods. And you just kind of see the difference. You see the difference yeah. in the, the homes and the apartments and all this sort of stuff. Okay. And that person concludes that life is better in the affluent suburbs. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what the person concludes, right? The, the homes are bigger, you know, right? The, the streets nice, are cleaner. Nice cars. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, right. So if, you're at, if they're asked about you know, the cleanliness of the streets or the cleanliness of the people in those places. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to, a uh, person in touch with reality is going to give an answer that corresponds to that experience. Now, whatever those differences may be, the person, I mean, one could, but an entirely different question than what are the differences between the rich and poor areas that you've driven through is how did they get that way? Mm -hmm. 
That's, those are not the same questions. Right. So it is completely, if you ask people to simply report their beliefs about differences between groups, that tells you nothing about either how the groups got that way, mm -hmm. or even, unless you ask about it, why the person thinks the groups got that way. Mm -hmm. Those are all different topics. Yes. What are the differences? How did they get that way? And why do you think they got that way? Yes. You, now, you could ask, you certainly could ask the person some variation of, well, what explains this difference? Mm -hmm. And that is going to be very hard to test for accuracy because we don't really, you know, we have arguments and ideas and claims, but really, th there's not really like, you know, definitive evidence on how groups got the way they got. Yes. So it's it, that means it ceases to become an accuracy question. Mm. I mean, if you can't if you can't do the comparison, then you can't evaluate it for accuracy. Now, what that also means is people getting up on pedestals and condemning people's explanations for group differences as inaccurate, that is itself unjustified in the absence of criteria for accuracy. Mm, yes, yes, I would agree with you there. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, three, the three different questions that are being asked, I think you can, I think if you're, if you're a researcher or an investigator or a scientist and you're trying to look at this, so let's say you're a social psychologist or you're a sociologist and you're saying, okay, these are the facts. So just use your example. These are the facts about uh, neighborhood A, which is more affluent, and neighborhood B, which is you know more impoverished. This is this is what is true, right? The streets aren't as clean. They're not as well kept. Um, you Schools know, are worse. Right. right. There's there's more. Yeah. You know. More crime. They, yeah. yeah. Right. 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 All those right. those things are true. Right. Right. True. Those are those are truth. Those are things that are. I mean, you have to be delusional right. to not recognize. That. <laughs> <laughs> but now, and, and that, that's not making a, 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 a moral judgment or right. any type of thing. It's just stating the fact. Okay. And, and let's, let's just say, before you continue, let's right. just be clear. It's not necessarily or even always true. I mean, there are some yes. low-income communities that actually have less crime than some affluent communities. Absolutely. If my un limited, under this is not my expertise, that, for example, heroin use is now worse in affluent communities yes. than it is in poor communities. So it's not, you know, we, we're, you and I are now walking through a specific concrete hypothetical. We right. just want to be really clear <laughs> that we're not making yes. universal claims. We're not making so, universal stereotypes. Right. <laughs> So, right, but so then how they got there is at the very least a multivariate analysis that needs to be done. There's going to be a, a variety of variables right. that could that could be there. And I think the problem becomes where people want to pick one or two things and say, right. these one or two things are the reasons for all of the problems here. They could be incorporated, but it's not going to be right. the definitive. And then the third part, which, you know, <laughs> I guess rightfully so, right, is the thing that most interests me is, um, well, the person ob having this observational data in their experiential field is the how they are perceiving all of those things is based on again a million things. You a know, million things. Th their personality, their temperament, mm -hmm. their experiences. Right. So you know, what were their specific experiences in other places analogous to this? Etc. So you're having all of these these uh, variables that are co colliding at the same time, which again, all of this, what you're saying, what I'm saying in our hypothetical example is that this stuff is just really fucking complicated. <laughs> it is. It is really very complicated. Hard. It's really right. And not only right. is it complicated because of all of the variables, but if you're trying to find interactions, right? You know, even if you're doing the best factor analysis, right? how you understand how this variable is connected with this variable and not all these other variables is really hard to do. Yeah, it's, it's really hard. Very, very hard. It's all really, really hard. It, it, right, exactly. I mean, that is one of the, I mean, so I keep coming back to this. One of the, the great lessons of the science reform movement that emerged from the replication crisis is that reaching conclusions that justify high confidence in psychology in social psychology, especially in soft psychology, 
is really hard. It is very, very hard. It is not done on the basis of one or two studies or papers. It's just not because there's too much uncertainty. It takes years to sort of skeptically vet the logic leading to the conclusions underlying those published papers. And it's only after years. And in fact, for me personally, prior to the advent of widespread pre-registration, so should, should I explain that? I mean, yeah, I don't know who please, this please, is. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so um, pre-registration refers to um, a creating a document before one conducts a study that says exactly what you're going to do in the study. It says what your hypotheses are. It says how you're going to collect the data, what you're, what, what, um, measures you're going to administer, whether they're questionnaires or some sort of behavioral measure or an implicit measure, um, and exactly what analyses you are going to perform to test those hypotheses. It lays it all out before you conduct the study. Now, what you know, this isn't this what normal scientists normally do? No, that's the point. That's why it was such a gigantic sort of revolution when it came on 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 the stage. That for my, you know, this began to come out about ten years ago. This idea of pre-registration, and it's pretty common now. Uh, but it, until around 2011, 12, it was all just about non-existent in psychology. So what? So what did that mean? What it meant that what psychologists routinely could do, and and there were even sort of socialization, you know, things that grad students were supposed to read that told us to do this in the. 80s and 90s. And the this is, well, cherry pick. You know, you want to tell a good story. You know, you know, run a bunch of measures and, you know, just explore them. And, uh, you know, what, it be, being that it's important to tell a good story, you really need to know your results before you develop hypotheses about them. And so the papers would be written up that are entirely making stuff up after the fact. And if you have enough variables, some of them are going to be statistically significant or strong relation, just by random chance. Don't, it, it's just noise. Noise will produce seemingly systematic relationships. Okay, so that's what was the field. And I'm not saying everybody did that. I don't think everybody did that. But on the other hand, there is really very little um, sort of, there are very few good tools for distinguishing work that did do that versus work that did not do that. Mm -hmm. So to me, what that means is the history of the field is a mess. It's, it's not that I know it's all wrong. It's that there's not good. It, there are some exceptions to this. There is sometimes there is work that I really do believe in. But for vast stretches of social psychology, I just it's really impossible to know mm, what yeah. the good work is and what the what what isn't. So, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 since we're on this, I, I, let me ask, I mean, I, I've had a few people on here that have, have talked about this in, in your, how your perspective on this is, you know, you're, you're kind of talking about a little bit or talking around it about the replication uh, crisis and, you know, maybe just tagging onto what you just said, just kind of give us an overview of how you see that. And then is there any positive movement towards fixing that, especially in the social sciences and yeah. social psych and psych in general. So we just chat about that. Yeah, well, it, you know, I think there, actually the replication, th there's good historical reasons for why it, the problems have been named the replication crisis, but I actually think it's a misnomer. I really think it should be called the sort of validity, credibility, and legitimacy crisis because it's much beyond repl replication is one tiny sliver yeah, like sure. it's an important one. It's a very important but very small sliver of the problems that plague social psychology for sure, and mm -hmm. it really other social sciences as well. So the replication crisis itself was simply these famous studies that didn't replicate. That you know uh, that this the, this and it was much worse than that because. This all broke in psychology around 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And there were like, there were hints and whispers before this. I mean, you know, Paul Meal, famous clinical psychologist of the like 60s, 70s and 80s, um, was ringing these alarms for decades. And he was very famous and very accomplished. And people looked at him with awe and then ignored everything he said. 
So, but I mean, that's not, that's like, that is not a cynical description. That is, yeah, that yeah. is an empirical description of exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, so but around, so, so, so one of the dysfunctions until this like 2010, 2011 was that it was very hard to get a replication even published. Mm -hmm. And, and this was because, right, if you do a replication, you, either of two things happen. You fail. Right, it doesn't replicate. Right, doesn't but replicate. of course, you're replicating someone's work. So, so who do the journals send it to? They send it to the original author, who has a vested interest in making sure the failure never sees the light of day. Right, or you just do the filing drawer thing, right? Where you're just like, well, we just pull, move the numbers around. We just, you know, well, that's I, I'm assuming you try and publish it, right? So, right. but this is why you couldn't get it. I mean, you could select out of right? But okay, so, so, but so it's going to be very hard to get a failure published. Right. Let's say you succeed. Well, there's nothing new here. Why should we publish it? Uh -huh. right. So it, it was just really hard to get a, a replication published, which meant we had these like single papers and these like conceptual replications. And you may know which conceptual replication is somebody kind of tests the similar hypothesis in a different way. There's no pre-registration. So we don't know, you know, are they reporting the three studies they conducted, or are they reporting three studies they conducted and not reporting the eight failures? Right. Like we just didn't know. We, right. There was no way to know. Uh, so, okay. So, there. So, so you have this. You have the replication process or, or problem, but it just goes so much beyond that. It's after that broke um, and sort of cracked open the reasonableness of deep critiques of how we go about business, critiques of all sorts of things started popping up all over the place. There, so there are now papers, that, uh, you know, they're not all, they don't always have crisis in the type, title, but they're essentially the theory crisis, so our theorizing is terrible, generalizability crisis, our generalizability is horrible, we have a measurement crisis, and you know, whether they're crises, that, I, I, that those are my words. They're not always the words yeah. of the actual articles, but these are deep, deep critiques, basically say taking to task almost everything we do. Yeah. So now that's not. I don't want to get all. Well, I don't want to get like completely cynical and nihilistic about it. This right. is not saying well everything we do is completely useless and don't even bother and just you know go into like architecture. Like that's <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, however, to recognize the deep imperfections in many of the things we do in order to sort of lip both ratchet up rigorous scientific skeptical vetting of anything that we produce right. and produce the sort of a more sort of intellectually hu uh, humble approach to uh, distributing our work publicly. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, we did these studies and it found that. So are we going to sing to the New York Times, you know, the importance of our discovery? Well, like that still happens a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, was this also just with like the kind of classic social psych studies? So Milgram and Ash and Sheriff and all these kinds of guys, or was it like more of the like newer kinds of studies too that were not replicated? Yeah, it was a mixed bag. I mean, so I think Milgram has held up pretty well, you know. Um, uh, but uh, the, the uh, people have gone back. I, I mean, I haven't done this. People have gone back to the Sharif studies. Mm -hmm. And so these are really schlocky studies. Like by yeah. modern standards, it's not yeah. really clear that there's a there there. I mean, maybe there is, but it's just, you know, the Zimbardo prison study is yeah. now being basically canceled. It's be being yeah. appropriate, justifiably purged. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, it was, yeah, it was no terrible. ethics back then. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's worse, it, I, to me, it was worse than the ethics. I mean, I, I, you know, it was that it just didn't show what it was purported to show. So, right. um, so uh, you know, and this is like a, like a legendary, it's like a, it was a yeah. mythic study on which yeah you know, social psychology was built yeah. um, in, in, in large part. Um, so, you know, some, some stuff, is held, you know, the Kahneman and Tversky stuff has held up very well, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there the, was the heuristics and biases that mm -hmm. you referred to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so stuff, you know, I, again, I flirt with nihilism, 
but I don't <laughs> usually actually go all the you way. You go full nihilism, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, how do you, so you talked about the pre-registration stuff, but what are some other ways in which you think that maybe now um, we can sort of kind of listen to kind of more of the bells that have been rung and say, okay, how do we kind of shore up some kind of strength of replicating things and making sure that it actually, you know, what one study says, it says, you know, many, many, many times, not just once or twice. How do, how do you think we're going to be able to do that or, or, well, there's, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of reforms that have yet to be fully, you know, I mean, the crisis started, the, the crisis really broke in like 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. So it takes, you know, it's all, it's in some sense, it's only 10 years. I mean, 10 years may sound like a long time, no, but, short, you know, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, people have to recognize that there's a crisis, then they have to think through, well, what would be a constructive response to this crisis? Then they have to write that up or, you know, and then that has to be skeptically vetted by the community. And then it finally gets out there and then it has to be itself put through the mill for years. So that, that so what is the that? Well, the that are these various techniques. One is pre-registration. So it, like, it's not clear to me. I, I if I had to bet if I had to bet my life that pre-registered studies were more valid, more credible than ones that weren't, I'll like just on average, a huge main effect for the credibility and validity and replicability of pre-registered studies, I would say that they are. I am reasonably confident that pre-registration has been a valuable improvement to the field, but I could be missing something. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know any evidence showing that's true. Right. So, Right? If this wouldn't be that hard for someone to do. You look at over the last what 10 years, studies that were or were not pre-registered, and then you see which ones of those replicate. Right. Right? I mean, if pre register <laughs> if I'm right that pre-registration is better, then the pre-registered studies should replicate at a higher rate than the non-pre-registered studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that should happen. Right. Well, but I don't know that it ha does happen. Yeah. Everyone, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, it's like a good idea that really makes no difference. I, you know, maybe there's so many problems that it's like, you know, if you have a car with four flat tires and, you know, and the, and the spark plugs are all dead and, you know, and the drivetrain is falling apart. If you fix one of the spare tire, one of the tires, the car is still not going anywhere. <laughs> Right. Well, we want the car to go somewhere. It's important. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that will happen. Right. Um, right. So real quick, I, I, we kind of talked about it, but I don't know if you want to say any more about uh, kind of person perception. I know. Right. That's kind of so, there too. I know that's, um, yeah. if I look in the cobwebs here, the two <laughs> ideas were um, identifiability and personality. Those are like the two things that people look for in person perception and some type of responsibility. I'm a little fuzzy on this. I mean, obviously this is your wheelhouse. Yeah. So, you know, one of the You know, it's both as both a rhetorical pushback and a bona fide important area of research. I think there's this idea that when somebody, when social scientists first are compelled to grapple with the evidence showing that at least for lots of stereotypes, not all, and maybe not even most, but for more stereotypes than most people think, people's beliefs are reasonably accurate in the sense that they correspond reasonably well. They correspond, they correlate moderately, sometimes highly, uh, with whatever criteria you have, whether the criteria are census data or meta-analyses or anything else. One of the sort of forms of pushback sort of goes like this. Well, may, you know, maybe these people's stereotypes aren't completely inaccurate in some sort of general sense, but what really matters is their biases in judging and evaluating p individuals. Mm -hmm. That's where it really matters. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like mm -hmm. what, what, all of a sudden the other thing, you know, this is an entire, it's like an apologia. It's like the old Catholic church is a <laughs> So the science would come along and the church would like publish all this stuff saying, no, 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 the scientists are all wrong. Actually, you know, the Bible is the holy word, yeah. right? <laughs> and, right, that, that's what it's like. It's like because yes. they're just making stuff up. They really are right. just making stuff up, and and we know that they're actually making stuff up because there have been tons of studies that have examined the role of stereotypes in person perception. Mm -hmm. Now, usually, what that means, and this is where it's like a reasonable thing to study, not just like some rhetorical thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a really important question to ask when people evaluate other people. 
especially in high stakes contexts, whether it's, you know, college or graduate admission or hiring or something like that, but even just, you know, in casual acquaintances and stuff, do they judge other people primarily on the basis of one's own stereotypes? So you have stereotypes about men versus women, you'd have racial stereotypes, social class stereotypes, what are regional stereotypes, accent stereotypes? I mean, there's just like zillions of things. So yeah. is that, do you judge people on the basis of the stereotypes or on the basis of their behavior, their personality, their accomplishments, their merit, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, it's, the question really only makes sense when people have the opportunity to know a person's personal characteristics. Right. Right. Because of course, if you don't have access to it, if you don't know their characteristics, you can't possibly evaluate them on it. Right. Well, that's, that's, like, the whole, that's the whole point of a heuristic is it's a mental shortcut because right, you don't have right, the time right. to go through right. all of these things. Right. So we have to have, we, I mean, we have them, whether they're good or bad is another question, but we have these mental yeah. shortcuts, these heuristics of like, okay, like, you know, someone comes to a job interview and they're dressed like they just climbed out of bed. Maybe they're not <laughs> the best employee. Right, right. Well, so, you know, for, for that, you know, there are all sorts of other real world, world things, right? I mean, there's, you know, if they're black versus white, Right. right or you or, or even black versus asian or asian versus white right, right? i mean you could do all the racial stuff um you could do, do accents if they speak yeah. Yeah. you know without a regional accent that usually right there's a high risk that that will be heard as more intelligent and more educated as more cosmopolitan whatever it might be than right. if you have a thick regional action whether it's southern or brooklyn or anything right so right and i would uh, imagine that would translate out towards uh, where uh, for folks that are um you know english isn't their first language and they have an accent from right, you know, right that's wherever, right. right you know that's right right that's right so so you know, the, these sort of superficial cultural demographic characteristics can and sometimes do play sort of an outside influence, outsized influence in those kinds of interactions. And there's good evidence for those kinds of biases, for, you know, biases to play themselves out there. Um, but, uh, but what we do know also is that when people have you know, they have the time, they have the capability, they're part of, you know, if it's an experiment, it's part of the experimental situation that they digest the information on someone's personal characteristics. That is, you know, maybe it's a, a, a study of sex bias and hiring, and you have the resumes, mm -hmm. you know, so you do this very easily experimentally, you have John and Jane, and they both have, you know, stronger, you know, you do it in four conditions, right? John has a stronger or weak resume. Jane has a stronger or weak resume. Everyone, you know, you only get one of those. So you, if you get John with the strong resume, you're not also getting John with the weak resume. You're not getting Jane with the strong, you're just getting John with the strong resume. And then there's other people getting Jane with the strong resume. And then there's other people getting John with the weak resume and Jane with the weak resume. So either you get bias or you don't. Right. I mean, it's again, this Nazis are not involved. You either get bias or you don't. And and you, you either get people relying on the strong versus weak resume. Mm -hmm. the, again, no Nazis, just, you know, either they're 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 making the judgment on the resume or on gender. And it doesn't matter, gender, sex, gender, race, social class, it's region, or anything. It just doesn't, whatever. This is one of the great things about the methodology. You can throw anything you want in there. And you can really study all sorts of stereotypes that way. Okay, so there's been so many studies like this, both experimental and non-experimental, you know, in real worlds. And was one of the things I did was for years, I had this gigantic data set, which I did not collect, but I was using, um, uh, on teachers and students, and so I was going to uh, ask yeah. you about that. I, I, do you? Do you yeah. I don't know if you it was a uh, Rosenthal, right? That was the big. big well, study. Rosenthal kicked it off. My, my advisor was Jackie Eccles. She's okay. was at the University of Michigan, and she collected this amazing data in schools. And 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 um, so you know, it, it was like thousands of students and stuff. So mm -hmm. you could we could and did look at well, you know, were teachers grading students primarily on the basis, or well, the real question is, how much was teachers grading students based on their demographics versus based on their you know, measures of performance and achievement? 
because right. we had standardized achievement tests mm -hmm. and it was almost entirely achievement. So, uh, I, okay, and that was a, I don't want to overstate my role in this. There have been so many studies of this, mm -hmm. uh, experimental, non-experimental, that there was a, a meta-analysis conducted in the 90s that described the effect of the personal characteristics, individuating information. It, it, it's called individuating information because it's like what you are like as an individual, as opposed to as a group member. Right. Um, uh, that those effects are just gigantic compared to stereotype bias effects. It doesn't mean stereotype bias effects don't occur, right. but the effects are gigantic. So, and, and, and when you put all that together, it does mean if you're, in a high stakes position, like doing graduate admissions or hiring, it is useful, in my opinion, to be aware of the evidence on bias, because you know you don't always know when you're being biased. As much as I, I you know, I've done a lot of critique on the implicit bias stuff, because I think the way that has done has been done has been very uh, sort of weak and scientifically problematic. Uh, but nonetheless. I, I buy the general argument that sometimes there are some biases that you it's at least possible that you don't even know that you're operating on. And so one way to uh, protect against that is to understand what the literature on stereotypes and person perception actually shows and just say, okay, there's a bit of an effort, you know, there's a bit of an onus on me as a decision maker to make sure I play, pay close attention to the individuating information. Because if I do that, you know, I'm going to be evaluating people on their merits. And isn't that what I really want to be doing anyway? Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you, how do you, how do we have these more, I mean, it's a big question, right? How do we have more, I guess, uh, I don't say corrective, but I guess more accurate. How do we push for and move towards, you know, more accurate um, heuristics, more accurate stereotypes, more accurate by, I mean, how do we, I don't, I'm, I'm with you on this, obviously. Like, I don't, I don't think, you know, people, uh, I think in society, they just, these words are dirty words, but we're always making discriminations, right? We discriminate between thing A and thing B. We discriminate between lots of things. We have a stereotype or a heuristic because we don't have time to do all of these, this long cognitive processing in each, every single moment. So I don't think all these things are inherently bad, but you know, what, what kind of ways can we push for more accuracy in doing these things? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, well, I mean, accuracy is it's, it's, accuracy is probably hard, but yeah. you know what? What really matters? I don't know. I guess lots of things really matter. The, the things we're talking about now are things are, are mostly the stereotypes and personal perception type things, right? We're talking about jobs or graduate school or whatever, and there, uh, you know, assuming you're a person who doesn't want to be prejudiced or bigoted, who doesn't want to be biased against people based on their demographics or anything else. I mean, if you do, like if you just, if you're an actual white supremacist, right, or, you know, well, uh, uh, you know, or an old, what, what they would have called 30 years ago, a male chauvinist and you're proud, well, I don't have, you know, I don't know what, the, there's, there's no, the, the, the civil rights laws are the solution to that, right? <laughs> right? But, but it, you know, if you're a, an otherwise well-intentioned, well-meaning person who yeah. wants to do the right thing, th for, for these situations, it is fairly simple. And nothing's ever simple, simple, but, you know, really just pay close attention to the personal characteristics. Judge people, you know, if it's admissions to graduate school, you judge them. You judge them on their GPA. I mean, GREs are now controversial, which I think is one of the stupidest controversies we've ever had. No. Uh, but, you know, you judge them on their research accomplishments. You judge them on the quality of their personal statement. I mean, you judge them on the things that we have. I think the, the things that we get are imperfect, but pretty good things to judge people on and you do that more than on the basis of these other things and mm -hmm. that's how you get around the bi the bias problem yeah well it's true for a job too i you know that's you know yeah no i'm, I'm with you i i think you kind of mentioned it and so we can we can we can uh transition to that so, so um i know you have done a lot of work i've talked about it loosely on certain other episodes here but uh let's let's talk about i guess let me let me just let me just wide lens it for a minute so let's talk about 
bias in general for, for us as humans? And then how do we understand that as explicit biases and then implicit biases? And then we can get to the I, I, A, T. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Okay. So, uh, and, and I, an explicit bias is usually, well, again, all th- these terms are so contested that, you know, I, I'm not really, I'm speaking from my sense of my, like my sort of gist, gist of how other science, well, I would distinguish between how scientists versus lay people use these terms. Sure. That there's a lot of overlap, but, but, but they're not, it's not complete overlap. So, Explicit biases are usually biases used using, you know, basically ask people because they're questionnaires. So if you ask people, how much do you like white people and how much do you like black people or how much do you like Latinos and how much do you like Asians? I mean, you could ask, they're feeling thermometers that basically say rate how warmly or coldly you feel about any, you can plug in any group you want from zero to hundred. Well, mm-hmm. anytime you get a difference, that's a bias of some sort. Mm-hmm. Right, that's an explicit bias because, like, you know, you ask people and they're telling you the answer. An implicit bias. What the hell is implicit bias? Well, one, this is one of my critiques: is that there there is no scientific consensus as to what implicit bias yes. is. Like everybody and their brother uses the term, but if you actually look at the peer-reviewed scientific writing on it, like, there's no majority uh, opinion. Mm-hmm. There's no consensus definition as to what implicit bias is. What what are some of the more common definitions? I I I, I guess I've I seen this as well, and I'm like, there is there's no general <laughs> right. agreed upon the, definition. What, but what are some? Yeah. Of, well. Okay. So what one? So one of the um one of my favorite things to point out is that work on implicit bias is itself often one of the main examples of the fact that implicit bias is real. Hmm. And the reason I say that is that to me, what an imp, again, this is not a consensus view. Although others, some people might agree to this. I I mean, I I don't know how many people would agree to this. Implicit bias is a bias on anything that people are not explicitly acknowledging. That's it. It's implicit. So they may be conscious of it. They may know exactly what they're doing, but it's not, they're not saying this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so, so this is why I say implicit bias is one of the best examples of the reality of implicit bias. And that is when we we just submitted a review, it's going to be a book chapter. um, That is a, that is a critique of all this. Um, which I'm calling up right here because we have a slew of definitions in there. Mm. Um, uh, It is, but uh, is that the, the single biggest thing, the single biggest definition we found in the scientific literature was no definition at all. And most of those papers use the IAT as a measure. Mm -hmm. So implicitly, their definition of implicit bias is whatever is measured by the IAT, mm-hmm. which is why, which is why I say work on implicit bias is itself some of the best example, one of the best examples of the existence of implicit bias, and that's a bias because there's no thought, no justification, no, it's just taken for granted in this knee jerk kind of everyone knows the IAT measures implicit bias kind of way, which. Mm-hmm. Everyone certainly does not know. And if you paid attention for two seconds, you would see that. Not only does not everyone know, it's, it's controversial within the social science literature. Mm-hmm. So, so, okay. So, so the most common definition is no definition at all. Mm-hmm. And it is the implicit assumption that it's whatever is measured by the IAT. So here are some others. So in this chapter, in this review, this was one of our points that there is no widely accepted definition. It, the definitions are all over the place. So here are some of them. This is from, this is a famous article, Payne and Company, 2017. The idea is that people harbor mental associations based on race, gender, and other social categories 
that may lead to discrimination without intent or possibly even awareness. Okay, so without, uh, I mean, I could spend half an hour on each of these definitions. <laughs> so, but one, a definition that incorporates a causal claim yeah. is a weird definition. That's very strange. Right? It's right. I mean, if, if you want to say A causes B, that's fine. Right. But that means A and B have to be different things. So mm -hmm. if you're defining A, don't tell me about its relationship to B. That's something you have to establish. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, and, and then th then you have the weasel word in there, may. Right. right? So, OK, <laughs> well, it may lead, but that, I mean, just in the literal. So I have this problem all the time. The stuff implies things, right? Like, why is he saying may lead to discrimination rather than may or may not lead to discrimination? Doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. Kind of because they suspect it does. So, what are you building a hypothesis into the definition? Like, what, mm -hmm. what does that even mean to build a hypothesis into a definition? I, like, it's gonna makes my head explode. Okay, mm -hmm. so that that's that one. Um, here's another one. This is Dower, and this is a pretty influential article also. Implicit bias can be defined as implicit group-based behavior. So on the first one, we had mental associations. Now we have group-based behavior, which is behavior that is influenced in an implicit manner by cues that function as an indicator of the social group to which others belong. So this is like this is a tautological definition. Right? This is a de the definition folds in on itself. Implicit yeah. bias is implicit this. Well, what the hell is this implicit thing? What is that? Now, I, I, you know, may maybe I, I don't remember. I didn't commit either of these articles to memory. Maybe that idea is unpacked later sure, in the yeah. articles. You know, so but but the definition does not stand as written. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just it's like you know. What is a flood? Well, a flood is when the water floods and you know the floods are high enough. That's what a flood is. <laughs> like, what does that mean? This is like again, make my head explode. Okay, so I do I'm gonna do one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more here, and then I'm just gonna stop. Um uh this is Chapman, Katz, and Carnes. Carnes is very famous. Cultural stereotypes may not be consciously endorsed, but their mere existence influences how information about an individual is processed and leads to unintended biases in decision making comma so-called implicit bias that's probably the best one out of the three there's some things in there that i can kind of like okay the cues i could see but yeah the <laughs> I mean, again, it has this influence thing yes, happening, yes, you know, right. and right. And so, unintended. So, implicit bias is unintended biases in decision making. Like, what does that even mean? Right. What, what, I, you know, what does that mean? So, right. I, I mean, again, you know, I, I don't have the whole article. I didn't commit the whole article to memory. There may well be a more reasonable perspective, but as a definition, it's just. You know, it just doesn't. I, I mean, it's just a terrible definition. To me, it's a terrible definition. Yeah. But yeah. but the more important to me, even if it was not even, so you're gonna have lots of listeners. Maybe I'm going too far. Maybe it's not a terrible definition. That's not the important point. <laughs> right. The important point is these definitions are all over the place. Yeah. Even if each one, on its own merit, stands as a wonderful definition, they're all completely different. Yeah. One is associations. One is behavior. One is culture. It's like what? It's just like what? It's like everything. Implicit bias is whatever we want to be long as we can say something bad about it <laughs> well there's that's the other thing there's no neutrality to it which is so bizarre and so my thing is like how do we study something we don't know what the hell it is I, I, the answer I, was badly, I, the answer I, was badly. <laughs> well it's just like i'm fine with wanting to study it i'm fine with you know yeah. like hey look maybe maybe intuitively that would make sense that we have you know biases we're not aware of fine but if we can't define what we're studying, <laughs> <laughs> what right. the heck do we have there? Right, right. And, and then I guess the, my next question is, okay, this is maybe, maybe this is a little bit, you know, too much of a of guesswork, but why, why are people looking at this? Why do they care? Why do they want to know about this? You know, why, why do they want to know about, you know, implicit biases? Um, well, I mean, it, they don't really... I mean, piecing together 
the lines of argument that kind of launched it in the 90s is, and I think this is part of the, it's like a core part of the narratives that have emerged on the left that have explained um, the persistence of group-based inequalities. So, you know, you had the landmark uh, civil rights legislation of the 60s, yep. um, which basically illegalized Jim Crow and legal segregation and all that sort of stuff. Right. Um, and yet inequality has basically persisted. It's improved somewhat, but it hasn't improved very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, given that the legal, ba the legalized barriers, some of the worst institutional, you know, uh, practices and policies that mandated inequality have been torn down, there must be something else. Mm. And that is true. I mean, that you, you pretty, that is a true statement. That absolutely has to be a true statement. And so in, in, in sort of classic, so, right, so one of the classic findings in social psychology is the fundamental attribution error. So that when people do something, people go right to, you know, they, they did that on purpose. Like, you know, sort of under, discounting of their situation, not being aware of their situation, and so therefore not accounted for it. So in classic social psychological manner, consistent with the fundamental attribution error, it must be something evil in people. Yeah, the, the, the example I always tell my students is, um, it's like the person that cuts you off and on the highway. And the first thing this person says is, Oh man, look at this fucking asshole. He doesn't have, right. he doesn't care about anything. Right. Wow. This guy's a right. terrible person. Right. That's the, you know, you're, you're, you're giving yeah. the um, uh, dispositional kinds of aspects right. more weights than the situational ones. Right. So then my, <clears throat> I'll say, but what are some alternatives to this? Well, Maybe his uh, very pregnant wife is in the passenger seat and she's in the middle of labor and she's already like dilated and he's rushing to get to the hospital and he's just weaving out of lanes. So that's a very realistic possibility, right? So, but yes, yeah, so to your point, we're typically making kind of, you know, dispositional or things about okay. a person attrib att um, attributions, um, which is the fundamental <laughs> error right which is right. Know, that's so, not yes, always right. the case <laughs> right that's that's right so but so i think that's probably in the mix you know and and the social psychology has this long deep infatuation with sort of hidden forces that goes back at least to the 1940s. What do you mean? So there was a sort of a scientific movement in the 1940s called the New Look in Perception. Hmm. And the name New Look was sort of amusing. There was, a, um, I think right after World War II, there was a new look in fashion. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't have the full history. So it was sort of cutely named after that. Okay. And so the idea prior to the new look in perception was that, you know, perception was basically people were in touch with reality. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it, you perceived objects because the objects were out there and the purpose of psychology was to figure out how the image of the tree impinges on your visual neurons, which mm -hmm. then process it in some way and translates, you know, brings it up to, through various signals, brings it into the brain. And somehow in the brain, the image of the tree, which is actually out there, you know, emerges as sight, some, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's all like, you know, seeing people are in touch with reality. Okay. Right. So this crew, and it was a movement, came along in the 40s and said, not so fast. Uh, perception is not simply people being in touch with reality, uh, people's personalities, motivational states, preferences, desires, all influences perception. Mm -hmm. And it produced just this wealth of research seeming to show that. So I give one example. Um, they can I do this from memory? I wasn't. I was not thinking to to do this, but but so I'm, I'm doing this from memory. I might have some of the details off a little bit. Um, one of the classic, one of the one of the strongest. So it, it really went downhill from here. But one of the strongest studies 
presented to women, so this would be women in the late 1940s, words that were just conventional words like screen and dog and desk or something like that, tachystop, tachoscopically. So this would be, you know, at, progress, at, at very fast exposures. So if you only present it for a couple of milliseconds, nobody can figure out what the word is. The dependent variable is at what uh, time of exposure do they recognize the word? Mm -hmm. And so whatever, I'm inventing the results because I don't remember them. So let's say it takes 30 milliseconds on average to um, for people to recognize conventional words like desk or dog or, mm -hmm. or, or, or screen or whatever, rain or just conventional words. And then there were taboo words. And the taboo word, and again, this is the 1940s. I, I, I don't think they used actual profanity but the words were like rape and penis. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that, it, and again, I'm inventing the actual numbers, but the pattern was if it took 30 milliseconds for them to recognize, you know, rain and water and desk, it took 45 seconds, 45 milliseconds to recognize penis and rape. Mm -hmm. So what is this? This is perceptual defense. This is how it was interpreted. That threatening, sexually threatening words um, that people defend against them in a very almost Freudian psych psychoanalytic kind of way. And so it, it takes a longer exposure for people to recognize the words. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Floyd Allport, the other Allport, the Allport that everybody has forgotten. Uh, um, not, not, they, not, uh, uh, not Gordon. Not right. Gordon, right. Gordon, or whatever yeah, Gordon has the classic test, text, The Nature of Prejudice. And it was, it's a great, you know, he's yeah. actually... I, I could go do a whole thing on Gordon Allport. He was actually quite good and very reasonable, actually. Uh, but um, but Floyd, his brother, comes along and says very scientifically, very um, even-handedly, less um, uh, less pungently than I'm about to say it, but basically says this is all bullshit. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I mean that's really what it, and it is. I read his critique of the new look in graduate school, and I was like, oh my God, this knocked my socks off. Because his critique was a thing of beauty. He presented all of the kind of the way I just did it. You present the studies yeah. and what they did and what they found and how it seems to support this interpretation of motivation or personality or drive state or whatever. Influence and press seems very, and it, when you do it with all these studies, it's very persuasive. And then he debunks everyone. <laughs> in, in the case of the the rape and penis million tachistoscope study, what he says is, well, it's possible. It is possible that this was perceptual defense, but it's also possible that you know women in the 1950s, he's writing in like the late 50s, so it's not that different. But right. it's possible that that maybe it was the mid 50s that the women. It's not that they didn't recognize the word, but you know, these words are kind of taboo. And so maybe they were just a little more reluctant to say them out loud in front of an experiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not like there's no, so the argument is there's nothing perceptual going on. There's no defense, but, you know, there is a sort of social norm that says you really shouldn't say these words in public unless you're really, really sure. Mm. So we don't know that his explanation is right, actually. But nor do we know whether the other, and you know, we don't, okay. But my, and my only point of doing this is this, this sort of, this romance, I have no other way to describe it. Yeah. This romance with uh, things unconscious and that are not accessible and, you know, and, and, and you can see why, right? I mean, it, it sort of makes social psychology look impressive. Like we can mine the depths of people's souls for, for things they don't even know they have are in there, <laughs> right? You can totally, right? That makes us sound very impressive oh, yeah. if we're oh, able yeah. to do that, it's, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. really like, I don't know how to, how to explain it. It's almost, um, like uh i don't want to say like a superpower but it's like this like right right i don't know stuff you read in like comic books or stuff right. that's like really like whoa like right you know, yeah yeah right it, it's like it, it, it's like the uh it, it's our version of relativity 
Mm-hmm. Like this mm-hmm. amazing, mm-hmm. oh my God, normal people don't understand this, <laughs> but we social psychologists know how to do this. So that goes back to the 40s. Yeah. And, and you know, it did when Allport mostly killed it, it did disappear for a while. Mm. Um, uh, sort of. It sort of reemerged as cognitive dissonance theory, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. has a family resemblance in some mm-hmm. ways. Yep. And that took off in the 60s and 70s. Then it died. And by the 1980s, you had the rise in social psychology of work on automaticity. Mm-hmm. Especially the social priming, the the, the, yeah. the sort of John Barge made an entire career out of this stuff, um, and uh, that had a kindred with a new look, and it had a kindred both theoretically that you know it wasn't necessarily it, it included, but it wasn't restricted to motivations and personality. It was also beliefs and attitudes. You know, these are subconscious you could you could activate them in ways that people didn't even know they were being activated these sort of ideas and memory and then they would have downstream influences on judgment and perception and behavior there's a whole vast body of literature on this that everyone took for granted as canonical as like foundational to social psychology until the replication crisis showed that much of it can't be replicated right right so which which repeats you know it sort of repeats the 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 history of the new look of the 40s and 50s it's like we just you you know you know my my wife is a therapist Uh and in her training she read a book called a curious calling do you ever read that book so it's it's about so the book brings together anecdotal data because it's not a lot of like you know systematic survey social science type data on why people go into clinical psychology. And mm-hmm. the argument in the book, it's called a curious calling because most, not most, a disproportionate number of people go into clinical psychology because they have sort of mental health issues themselves and they yeah. really want to understand them and, yeah. and, and you know, and it kind of drives them into the, into the field. Mm-hmm. The book opens with this story, which is a metaphor. I mean, it might even be a poem. Again, I'm doing this from memory. Mm-hmm. There's a person walk, you know, who gets up in the morning, walks out of the house on their way to work and falls into a a gigantic pothole. And people have to help this person get out. And, you know, this person's a mess and they're injured and they get up and they go on the way. So the next day, when the person's getting ready to go to work, they're resolved not to fall into the pothole. And they walk down the street and they fall into the pothole and they get all messy and dirty and injured and they have to be helped out again. And the, so now the person's like really upset. And then the next day they like, you know, really think it through and are really like angry and disturbed and just like incredibly frustrated. And they keep falling into the pothole and they go out on their way to work and they're determined never to fall in the pothole again. And they fall in the pothole. And I don't remember how many iterations that has. I, I think it's more than three. It happens in several different ways. Right. And it ends with the person saying, I think I'll take a different way to work. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) And so this is all of social psychology. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh goodness. (laughs) That's a very, very good, uh, good narrative. (laughs) Well, I guess, <laughs> so this is, so this is like what was going on in the forties. This is what's the, the, ne- the newest iteration is this implicit bias stuff. So it is. So, I mean, this stuff is really uh, challenging now. So let's just briefly talk about the IAT. Maybe you want to, yeah. uh, you know, I can tee you up a little bit, but you know, the IET is implicit association <laughs> test. Um, and it's a test that was created not long ago. It's relatively new, 20 years. Um, and um, it's used for, I, I know it's used in a, a, uh, with an assortment of psychological and neuropsychological batteries as a 
as a way as a type of ancillary or, or tertiary kind of measure. So it's not it's not a big cognitive measure like you know any of the Wechsler systems or what right. for achievement or you know it's not an MMPI, it's not a MCMI, it's not a Rorschach, it's not any of these big kind of you know giant um, uh, measures. It's a it is a measure um, that's used to look at people's approaches. Right. Yeah. That's a very general way of saying it. And so, so yeah, I don't know how you want to keep explaining this, but let's go. Oh, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm actually one of the few sort of uh, deeply skeptical critics of the IT who has actually used the IT and I published the I, IT. I have, I've, I've used it as well for when I, when yeah, I was in yeah. uh, psychological batteries and neuropsych batteries. I've used it a few times and I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was like, oh, it's just a supplemental <laughs> test. Let's see what we find. You know, I didn't think anything right. of it. I was like, oh, okay. Cool. Yes, <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, so they, as, as a research tool, I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, it, it, there, there are, again, sort of fairly large swaths of uncertainty around what it captures, what it measures. Right. Um, but we mostly, so you, the, the most common usages are to capture people's attitudes or beliefs about something. Right. And when I say attitudes, I really mean in the broadest sense. So sometimes it's used to get implicit self-esteem, sort of, you know, unconscious mm -hmm. self-esteem or something like that. You know, again, well, exactly what it measures and what people define, you know, but th that's sort of kind of what they think they're doing when they're using it. Oh, and, you know, now somebody's going to denounce me for it, say, well, well, we know it's not unconscious. We, it's automatic. It's not unconscious. <laughs> so, okay, fine, fine. Yeah. So, um, it's so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Whatever. So, um, but it, you know, fundamentally, it's a reaction time test. Which, if you've done it, you know that. But for anybody listening, which means the the outcome is how fast you do stuff. Mm -hmm. And the sort of logic there is, if certain things, if doing something faster means it's easier, and then that has implications for how you think mm -hmm. and what you think, right? Mm -hmm. So, in in the classic, the original IAT. If people people were given words to sort into categories, mm -hmm. and if it was easier to sort those words into black unpleasant and white pleasant, so you, that's you, you have to put the word. So let's say the word is vomit. Does it go into black unpleasant or white pleasant? Well, it goes into unpleasant because it's unpleasant. Let's say let's say the word uh, you know it is. Um, it, uh, you know, or you may sometimes they would use names. The name, let's say, is Aisha. Is Aisha a black name or a white name? So people would assort it. But regardless of that, is it easier to do the sorting task into when, when you're sorting target words into black unpleasant versus white pleasant versus when you do it to black pleasant and white unpleasant? Mm -hmm. And if it's easier to do black unpleasant versus white pleasant than it is to do black pleasant and white unpleasant mm -hmm. that says there's a stronger association of black and un things unpleasant versus white pleasant than there is think black. okay and so that would be used to conclude that you have some version of a bad or negative attitudes towards you you you, you harbor implicitly racist attitudes right that, that's what that conclusion would be and that is probably um, you know, when you, when the IT is used to get at racism or sexism or any of the isms, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, it's just any of those, um, that's when it's actually most controversial yeah. uh, because it's just not clear to anyone other than IT advocates and acolytes, you know, the founders and acolytes, that it actually captures one's attitude. So, it, well, and, it, and, it, and it may to some degree, mm -hmm. but it's probably not a clean measure of anything at all. Right, because I, I think the, the part of the, the challenge with it is, is that it is a timed task, right? And so yeah. because it's a timed task, or it's, a, it's almost a reactionary kind of thing, um, it's, trying to, it's trying to weed out kind of any ability to formulate or think about it or you know problem solve or reason through it it's just trying to say what are these kind of almost reactionary things but and it definitely does capture that but it's not it's hard to know what you're capturing you're capturing something you're capturing a reaction but because someone is doing something right. very quickly a lot of the times people will guess right. they, 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 they don't like how many times i mean the one way to look at this is 
how many times have you been, uh, somebody has been taking a test and they don't know an answer and they just guess, they don't even think about it. That doesn't mean that, you know, that that's really what they thought the answer was. They just like, I don't know. I'm yeah. just going to put something. Um, so there's some elements of, again, I, I'm not saying it doesn't get at certain things. It obviously is getting something, but I don't <laughs> think that if you have all of these in a certain category and all these in a certain category, you're, you're racist and you don't know it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, and that yeah, you exactly. can't make That's, that causal claim from one ancillary test alone. You, you can't. You you really can't. And you know, the subsequent work has. Sh- I mean, I want to say the work has shown the work. It's the work that has shown stuff is itself has issues, but that um, its ability to. So I'm going to reread one of the definitions. Mm-hmm. Um. Implicit bias is the idea that people harbor mental associations. So far, so good. Based on this, this linking thing, I'm okay with that. As the IET operationalizing mental associations to at least some degree. Even that, it's other things beyond that. It's not a clean measure of association, but it probably is a measure of association, mental association to some degree. So I'm okay with that based on race, gender, and other social categories, so far so good, Mm -hmm. that may lead to discrimination without intent. Okay, so one, like, again, that's a hypothesis that doesn't belong in the the definition. Mm -hmm. Um, And whether it leads to discrimination has been assessed in lots of studies. Um, And the overall relations, it does depend on the meta-analysis in the study, is usually pretty low. I mean, it's like the effect sizes of car- comparable to correlations of around 0.2 or so. You know, some are actually even smaller than that, some are a little larger than that. Um, so, so it's not even clear what that means because I've done a deep dive into a handful of those studies, not, not a lot, and I, don't, I am not, because I haven't done that, I can't and I'm not claiming that what I'm about to say is representative of the work on discrimination. It's not, it's just like what I found in going into a couple of studies. The, some of the studies that produce, you know, non-zero, small or moderate, even moderate size correlations between the IAT and measures of discrimination. And I am thinking of studies that are on anti-black discrimination. So this is racist discrimination. Mm-hmm have no discrimination in them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you get a correlation when there is no discrimination? Well, you, you can actually, uh, because when I say there's no discrimination, there's no anti-Black discrimination. Mm-hmm. In one, people's responses ranged from anti-white to egalitarian. Yeah. So, yes, the IT correlated with that, but the the scores on the IAT that are routinely interpreted as, you know, bad attitudes towards black people, you know, racist attitudes, mm-hmm. those corresponded in the study to egalitarian people, uh, uh, egalitarian responding, treating mm-hmm. people, you know, black and white. In this case, is how they treated the black versus the white experimenter that they treated them really kind of similarly when they had high IAT scores that usually reflect racism. Mm-hmm. That's one way you can get it. Another way you can get it, you know, the people with the low scores were actually anti-white. They, they really they treated the black experimenter better than they treated the white experimenter. Then there's another paper where there was no there was no net discrimination at all, and I, you know I've, I haven't done the deep dive into the data, but you can easily get that, and you know by if high high scores do lead to a little bit of anti-black discrimination. And low scores lead to a little bit of anti-white discrimination. So it's not that low scores are egalitarian, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right? It's like they, you know, you can get a correlation across the spectrum as well. But no one, no one examines this for this thing. They, they, right. they, you know, they, they, you get a, people get a correlation at ah, racism, mm-hmm. and like maybe. Like we, it's sort of like the new look work. Like it could be, it's possible, <laughs> but it just doesn't show it. Right. Well, when I think the other problem is, is my my issue sort of with the test is, and again, it's not just with this. So, um, this is just true of any kind of measure. Is 
you have to look at the normative sample. Now, I haven't looked at the normative sample. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's not terribly robust, right? Maybe I'm wrong. But the other thing is also the test construction itself. For many people, right, when you look at certain item responses, a lot, again, a lot of people will have a word and they don't know where to put it. So they just stick it in some place. They don't know, right? And you're also depending on, now you could sit there and say, see, there it is. That's the implicit bias, right? <laughs> again, <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe. But again, if we can't agree on a definition of what that is, that's how are we knowing what it, what it, the, it is? We don't know. It's something, we don't know. but we don't know. But then right. it's also like, you know, you could, you could give this to somebody or you could give the test, you know, you could show them the same words and you can look at it for, for uh, you know, 10 people. And, they're, you know, if you start looking at the item responses, the item responses could say, well, what, what was the, the, what do we see that's common here? And for some people, there are some things where they don't know what it is. That doesn't mean that it's connected to something else. I'll give an example. So on the, um, oh, goodness, on the. I might be getting this wrong. Oh, it's been a while. On the Tom, it's the test of memory malingering, right? So this is a measure that you give. Basically, you have two uh, uh, spiral bound uh, books that you show pictures, and you have to tell the person, um, uh, you know, name this item, right? And it's basically an elephant, giraffe, you know, uh, you know, a golf club, you know, spoon, you know, basic stuff. So then you go through, and you it's like fifty of them, and you go through and you do it again. And if they get them wrong, the same one's wrong, the same item's wrong, that's one element of saying, like, are they lying, right? Are they feigning that they know? But sometimes there's some of the things on there where it's like, if I think you get to one of the last ones and it's, you know, trellis. Now, you might know what, what a trellis is, what it looks like. It's that thing. I've seen that before. <laughs> but knowing what the word is, like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I didn't know what it was the first time I gave the test. I was like, what the hell is this? What's a trellis? I was like, oh, yeah, it's that thing that you put plants on on the outside. I, was like, I didn't know what it was. I have no idea. So the fact that someone doesn't know, they're going to be like, pass, next. I don't know. Like, yeah, I know what it is. But like, okay, but that's a naming thing, right? That's yeah. that's that's yeah. that's a word retrieval. Right. Right. That's not a, a comprehension thing. Uh, right. right. This is another example I'm pulling from another test. But in the same way, right? You know, there's problems with some of the test construction again, which is fine. That's not a, that's not to pick yeah. on the test. Right. A test is new. It's been around 25, 30 right. years. It hasn't been around forever. So you right. have to say, okay, how do we know if someone, right, here's a name. Well, some person might think that's a black name. They might think it's a white name, but it could be really anybody's name. That doesn't mean that because you put it in this category, that means that you're secretly racist. It, there's just, there's just, it's, it's the problem is you're taking the answers and you're connecting it to strong positional things about people that right. maybe they are racist or have racist ideas, but you can't, I don't think may, it's not a one-to-one -one kind of correlation here, just based off the items alone. Right. Right. No, that that's exactly right. I mean, the, the, for me, the problem isn't that people use the IET in, or any implicit measure. Or, or measure that's supposed to get at things implicit in academic research to try and get a better understanding either of how the measure works yes. or of people and using it to actually, I mean, I do that. I use it to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're now, you know, the, the at the beginning of this podcast, you asked me about stereotypes and person perception. We have a series of studies doing it with the IT. To, to, does providing individuating information reduce the amount of bias mm -hmm. picked up on the IT? And the answer is it almost always does. Mm -hmm. So it actually functions a lot like the older work with explicit measures showing people even implicitly rely on individuating information pretty heavily when they have it. So, mm -hmm. uh, so this, I really, I'm, you know, I, I'm not just saying this. I, I have, you know, I use the IT. I think it's a potentially useful. Sure, yeah. Scientific tool and it's, okay, that's not the problem. The problem, the, the problems have escaped the lab. 
That's the problem. The right. problem is how it's used in the real world, both as political rhetoric and for all these ridiculous trainings that have proven to be almost entirely, well, that for which there is almost no evidence that they are effective. And it's like, sometimes it's evidence is they're ineffective. It's like when they bring the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park to uh, San Diego and then they escape from the from the mm -hmm. lab and, they, and it's just out and right. you know, it's just out in the right. world and everyone's like, oh man, like what in the world? Like this is, we thought <laughs> right. this was cool and now this is so not cool <laughs> right. anymore. It is kind of, yeah, that is a sort of a good, I like that metaphor actually of the, the dinosaurs escaping from Jurassic Park. So, but I, you know, I, I mean, I have a talk on all the stuff which I just called up. So I, I open up the talk. Like it's one thing to publish articles in, in you know, in, in academic psychology journals about what you find using the IT. And sure. you, you want to call it bias, that's fine. But there are these books, these sort of popular books, bias, uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. And this is by a famous social psychologist. Unconscious bias in schools, a developmental approach to exploring race and racism. And then this Banaji and Greenwald have blind spot, right? And you know, these are just these major things. So and then I just go through this whole thing. You know, you can find implicit bias memes on, you know, you do a Google image search. Yeah. And like one of the things that pops up, or at least popped up early for me, was like a brain that has implicit bias written over the brain. And it's just like, you can't make this stuff up. You just can't make this stuff up. So, you know, there's, and there's implicit bias trainings everywhere. They're in universities, oh, yeah. they're in corporate Starbucks boardrooms, doing corporate it. Right. police, and there's just no evidence. Yeah, it's made the presidential campaigns, like both Clinton and Harris have referred yeah. to implicit bias as if they know what they're talking about. And I'm quite sure that they don't right. um I, I, I you know so it, it, it it's it, it's how it's escaped into the world yeah. on the basis of such feet of clay that is the problem people think they know what they're talking about and they don't mm -hmm. you know um uh and I, you know, bit, these snake oil salesmen yeah. are providing these implicit bias trainings, which, you know, every organization, every, a ridiculous number of, org of yeah. uh, organizations in the country, including all sorts of universities, mm -hmm. are ado adopting as if they think something good is going to come of it. Right. Well, and there's a research that shows that these types of, you know, kinds of trainings don't really have any efficacy as far as they know. Right. right. And they, right. And there's some <laughs> evidence for, uh, uh, for them actually being dysfunctional. So I just, you know, I, again, I have this stuff all over this talk that I have. So I'll just walk through a little bit of this. When I, when I go through the talk, I kind of debunk as much of, you know, I kind of walk, walk back the more extreme claims mm -hmm. of, of, and so after that I say, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's just me, but no, it's not just me. And then I just go through a bunch of uh, a bunch of recent peer-reviewed papers, some in very major outlets that I'm not an author of. So, you know, right. this is uh, a meta-analysis of procedure to change implicit measures. Finally, and I'm quoting because I'm reading it, changes in implicit measures did not mediate changes in explicit measures or behavior. So, so it's unconnected, right? If you do an intervention to reduce implicit bias, it has no effect on behavior. At least when this crew did it, that's what they found. So that's one. Okay, this is from uh, a, a guest post on my blog site. This is a sociologist. Uh -huh. Many findings in psychology are celebrated in part because they were shocking and seemed almost magical. So magical that many bear a strong resemblance to voodoo. The main being, the main difference being an appeal to mysterious, unobserved, unconscious forces rather than mysterious, unobserved, supernatural ones. <laughs> I just love that quote. Um, so, I, you know, it's just there's, there's there is this great walking back of the more extreme claims, but in some sense, it's it's too late because it's escaped out into the world, and uh, you know, people are now inflicting this on others in the name of social justice or doing something good. And, uh, you know, at, at, at best, I mean, at, at best, they're actually causing harm because there's no evidence, that, and that's at best. And the harm is people are paying for these. So mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're spending good money on something that's completely worthless. And, and then there's all the time that like employees or whatever are spending in this that could be devoted to something useful. Um, so at, at, at 
best, there's the unintended negative side effects of inflicting useless interventions on people. At worst, they're actually doing harm by making people sort of angry and resentful and, uh, you know, it probably increases self-censorship and self-righteousness for certain people. So it's, it's probably the rhetoric around implicit bias, in my opinion, has probably contributed to what some people call cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's sort of a weird, I'm not completely crazy about it. I mean, I use it sometimes, but the, the, I really think of it as punishing people for expressing ideas you don't like. And, and I think you know, people believe erroneously that they can now spot other people's unconscious racism and you know, their dog whistles and their code words. And you know, when they spot those dog whistles and code words, really the best thing to do is to denounce that person. Because we can't have a racist society, can we? And we've been working, you know, this is, we need to expunge all this from society. Yeah, and I, I think, I think, I, I totally agree. I think the, there's a few problems with that. So I, I, at best it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's inaccurate, it's harmful, and it really is causing harm. But I, I don't think intentionally, but I, I think it, I think it is, you know, part of the process that's happening. But it is also one of those things where, um, you know, if you push back on that, you say, well, you know, I don't really know how, uh, you know, uh, statistically valid and reliable that stuff is, or whatever, then it's just like, you know, like you just oh. said the worst thing on the planet. And it's like, yeah, like, I, it's like, well, it's obvious. And it's like, ah, uh, is it? I don't know. I don't know if it is. And then, you know, I've had some conversations with folks where I've tried to explain this. And, you know, I'm getting looked at sideways. And I'm just like, look, you know, it, it might be, but I mean, we don't yeah. know that empirically. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're yeah. trusting the science, but the science doesn't know this, right? It doesn't, right. doesn't figure this out. We don't know how to define it. We don't know what it is. And, and the, the, the authors of the test themselves have, you know, at least one or two of them have come out and said, like, look, we didn't mean for this to be applied within society so quickly at this length. Mm -hmm. And we also have challenges where we would like to keep studying this in, in academia and yeah. trying to get it better. And it just kind of just took, it ran off on its own. And, um, yeah, and I think that there's a, you know, there's the utility of it, right? It's like, well, what are you doing with this, right? And what I tell folks sometimes is, how can you understand or think you understand someone's unconscious state or their or their things unbeknownst to them? How are you going to be able to know that? If, if I don't know what's going on internally for me, how is someone else going to know what's going on internally for me? How is that possible? Well, so I, so let me give you a, a sort of a much more neutral example, and sure. this is really to so I think the, the answer is you can, and, and sometimes it's not that hard. So, it, but it, and it, it'll be easy to see this in a more, in this sort of more neutral case. Mm -hmm. So, a demonstration that I do when I teach intro social. Mm -hmm which is not original. I think I, David Myers has a very famous intro social book and I'm sure I got it out of his, his materials. Um, and maybe it's not even original to him. I don't really even know, but that's where I got it from. Um, the, like the first or second class, I will hand out a handout that describes the, an area of research. Um, I think the area of research that I have used, or at least one of them, was in romantic relationships. The research has shown that, and then it, then it's, it becomes an experiment. Half the class gets opposites attract, <laughs> and the other half gets whatever, birds of a feather flock together. That's right. what they get. Right. And everyone is asked if they found the results surprising. Mm -hmm. vast majorities in both halves say they did not find it surprising. Mm -hmm. Opposite findings. Mm. So that, that is called hindsight bias mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, you think you would have predicted it. You think you knew it all along. We know that that can't be because there's not really any serious difference between students on one half of the room and the other half of the room. They are not, I, I would, I think it's plausible that they're not aware that they're doing it. 
and if that's true, and I don't didn't assess that directly, but if it's true that they are not aware that they're doing, that is a type of implicit bias because it is a bias and they're not aware of it. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can so, see that. So, you know, and you can do that with lots of, you know, look, the priming, the barge priming stuff, if it held up, would be evidence of that. Like yeah. it is possible to do. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's true, right? But it is possible, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I, I mean, I, it's like what I tell people with microaggressions. I'm like, look, I'm not saying they don't exist. I just, yeah. I think it's where people, I think it's also true with the implicit bias stuff. It's like, yeah, we don't, we don't have good definitions. We don't have good ways of measuring it, but I'm not totally throwing it out either. Right. right? Yeah. Like I, right. Yeah, I yeah. just think it's, but I, I guess I think what you and I both are saying here is it's just where it ballooned up to and where right. it's just this, you know, kind of this Frankenstein monster being created. It's just like, whoa, whoa, oh, But whoa, this whoa. is like, they're, they're real, again, this is like, you know, it's just deja vu all over again. It's the person falling into the pothole. So, you know, I really first, it, it really is. I mean, I cut my teeth on this with my early, my earliest work was on self-fulfilling prophecies. So that's the Rosenthal stuff you referred to earlier. The idea is, I mean, um, the, the, you know, the way he did it was, Okay, is the way he did it was to induce positive expectations. Like these kids are going to show dramatic improvements in performance over the upcoming year. And in his study, what they reported was that those kids actually did improve more than the other kids. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There was no reason to think these kids were going to show any more improvement than any other kid, but they did. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. So I started studying it. And you know, this is how I, you know, this is how I got one over to, you know, the, the, the Nazis, right? <laughs> is, is to do this in the real world, um, uh, you, you, you have to control for accuracy. So you can assess people, uh, teachers naturally developed beliefs about kids. So let's say, you know, I believe, you know, Bob is smart, but Mary is not. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it, it? You know, and let's say at the end of the year, Bob ends up doing better than Mary. Well, mm -hmm. what is that? Is that a self fulfilling prophecy? Is it accurate? Maybe Bob really is smarter than Mary, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like you, so to assess that, you have to actually control for what the kids are actually like and show that teachers predict over and above their, you know, at minimum, the prior levels of achievement. Mm -hmm. So we do that. So when I did that over and over and over again, we consistently found evidence of self fulfilling prophecy. So kids lived mm -hmm. up or down to teachers' expectations, mm -hmm. but those effects were small, they weren't zero. They right. were small compared to the extent to which teachers perceived kids differently because they really were different coming in. Mm. Okay, so I'm doing this, and you know the rhetoric. So I'm doing this in like the 1980s, and the rhetoric surrounding both self-fulfilling prophecies and biases is how these things are powerful and pervasive. They're just everywhere. There's even a line from a, I think it was a, I think it was actually as late as 2010. A handbook chapter in social psychology taught that this is close to a direct quote. It's at least a very close paraphrase how self fulfilling prophecies dictate people's life outcomes. That's and the, di the dictate, yeah, right? I mean, dictate sounds to me like an effect size of 1.0, <laughs> right? I mean, that's what dictate means. This is scientific, you know. Now, if this was you know, Slate magazine. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> political rhetoric. You know, you, you know, yeah, okay, you're, you're kind of making a point. But, but this is supposedly scientific writing. So, you know, in scientific writing, like, do you want me to treat it as political rhetoric? Or do you want me to treat it as an actual scientific statement? Because if it's an actual scientific statement, it's stupid. I mean, it's really, it, I mean, it, it, it not only is it deeply wrong and at best misinformed, it really is stupid because we don't produce effects of 1.0. Right. We've never done that. Right. It, it, is, it is literally a stupid statement. Yeah. The person who wrote it might be brilliant. And I, you know, but, but that's not the point. The statement is stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's, again, it, it, your the the story is going to stick with me. It is falling into the same pothole every. It's every, yeah, every over, and over, over, over and over, over and over. So okay, so we'll we'll uh, last <laughs> topic we can hit here is um, yeah, it's a big one. So you know, but uh, let's talk about we we've, we've sort of kind of been you know flirting into these kind of areas naturally, <laughs> but um, yeah, this kind of illiberalism in 
the a- academia and then uh and then in a kind of society at large you know, give us give us your thoughts i know you have many <laughs> <laughs> i mean look 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 let's let's just be honest here right i you know you're you're you've been doing this for a long time you've you've seen you know kind of things come and go certain trends and I mean, right. I mean, you're at a, you know, very good school. I mean, you're the chair. I mean, like you see this up at the higher levels than just yeah. like, you know, um, you know, other, other just professors or adjuncts or things like that, or other researchers. Like, I mean, you have a view that I think, you know, not a lot of other people do. I mean, what is your, as much as you feel comfortable, you know, uh, no. what do you want to, what, what are you seeing? What, how, what are you feeling? So, uh, I mean, I have never seen, let me let me put it to uh, uh, let me do this as my opening sort of comment. I went into social psychology because I was really interested. I thought it provided just you know really interesting and exciting ways to uh, try to understand what made people tick. Why do people do what they do? Yeah. Um, and I saw myself as pursuing you know, however imperfectly truths about that, like, you know, what makes people take, how do they operate? What, you know, how do people think? What influences how they feel, how they treat other people? You know, it's actually how I started studying stereotypes, prejudice, and self-fulfilled prophecies. Um, And, and that was really, that was what I wanted to do. I never saw myself as an activist, like, like I know the answer and therefore I want to change the world and I want to do my research, you know, to prove how the world has to be changed, you know? So, so I never was like that. That, that just, you know, that didn't have an interest in, to me. So I never thought of myself, I thought of myself as seeking truth however imperfectly and not as any kind of activist. I've been an activist on and off. I mean, I was an anti-Vietnam now, more activist uh, for a couple of years in the 90s, I was one of the people heading up a group um, to sort of uh, promote and advance school funding bills. So New Jersey schools are funded by property taxes. There's a vote every year on the school budget. So we formed a group to build a new school and to, to do that. And then actually in 2017, I, I was appalled by Trump in 2016. Um, and I, for a little while, headed a small indivisible group. So indivisible group is were one of these groups that were in, uh, part of the resistance to Trump and all that sort of stuff. And our main, we were part of an, so, so I lived at the time, my district, the, the congressman from my district was sort of a moderate Republican. Um, and re- if you remember in 2017, one of the first things Trump tried to do was overturn Obamacare. Mm-hmm. So our, and, and he was doing, you know, you're Trump in the presidency and you're Republicans in majorities in both the House and Senate. Mm-hmm. So the only way this was going to fail is if some Republicans could be flipped from supporting the repeal to opposing the repeal. And because our guy was sort of a moderate on the fence Republican in a district, you know, he won kind of a close election two years previously. He was one of them targeted to flip and we flipped him. He ended up voting not to repeal Obamacare. Now, when I say we, we were a small group. Lots of other people were involved in this effort. I don't want to over... So I have been an activist, but my activism has been separate from my social science. It's like, you know, it's not like I'm doing social science to change the world. At least Mm -hmm. it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I entered grad school in 81. So from like 1981 to like 2020, I didn't think of myself as an activist. Last year, that changed, hmm. um, and it, it. I now think of myself as an activist, actively seeking to defend academic freedom. Um, so, about three or four years ago, um, it struck me that uh, this was all under threat. That right. that um, you had this rise. You know, at the same time that you had the rise of, of, of Trump and all the dysfunctions on the right associated with Trump, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fake news and conspiracy theories and, 
just, you know, the sort of complete rejection of any kind of expertise, even when they really were experts. Um, uh, on So you had that stuff on the right. And then on the left, you had this sort of rise of kind of an intolerant authoritarian left. Um, and you, you have it in academia. Um, and it's been getting, you know, it had been getting worse for a long time. And then about two or three years ago, um, it started manifesting in ways I had never seen before. So with people being fired for, you know, making essentially science or social science claims, the wrong ones, sometimes they'd say it on Twitter, um, uh, you know, the, the most recent example that I, I know of is this guy, Charles Neji, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, who was fired by the University of Central Florida after, after a tweet saying black privilege is real. And what he meant by that is by virtue of being beneficiaries of affirmative action and sort of preferential treatment for college admissions. That's what he was talking about. So, uh, you know, should he have put it that way? You know, are there other things going on besides that? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But but it, but it, well, I, probably I, not know, the best choice of words there. <laughs> right. It was probably not the best way to put it, yeah. that, that's, especially in the current environment. But, right. Right. you know, the 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 you know, the idea that this is a firing offense strikes me as really far more dangerous than anything he tweeted, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So you have you have that tweet. Uh, you have, I don't know if you saw the Princeton petition where the Princeton faculty are, mm -hmm, were calling mm -hmm. for a committee to basically vet anything that comes out of Princeton for racism. Yeah, yeah, I did see this. And I mean, it's like an operational definition of big, big brother. Like they're asking for big brother. That's what they're asking for. Yeah. So, so, um, so those are just a couple of examples. So you have like this rising rejection of academic so there's that oh and then you have retraction by outrage mob so i've never seen anything like this yeah. so the retraction has been around for a long time right usually art when articles get retracted it's for data fraud like it's discovered mm -hmm. that the researcher made up the data yeah, they lied or, about at minimum it. yeah right that's right or or, there, or even if they never catch the person red-handed there are so many demonstrable errors that the whole thing is not credible and so it's retracted Okay, and that's fine. That's fair. That's reasonable. That's scientifically appropriate. Right. The last couple of years, you've seen more and more retraction by outrage mob. So somebody publishes some finding that offends some sort of left narrative or sensibility, and it's always on the when it's retraction by academic outrage mob. It is always by the left. And that's because there's hardly any right wing people in academia. There's not enough to form an outrage mob. So it's just like, I, I really doubt that people on the left are any more censorious than people on the right. But there's just so few people on the right in academia that it just never comes up. And there are ample examples of um, outrage mobs being ginned up by sort of Fox News and Breitbart and that whole media complex that have led to academics being fired and stuff. So it's not, it's not that the left is worse than the right. That's totally not my point. I think this sort of intolerance exists on both sides. Is it is it exactly equal? I don't know. I don't even know how I would evaluate that. But within academia, you have this rise of, of left-wing authoritarianism, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's these multiple... It, it's like all these manifestations, firing people for, you know, saying the wrong thing in the wrong way, which is not, you know, which is really, again, I don't want to personally be in the business of defending the idea that black privilege is real. However, right. it's, it, 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 it is an idea that I think actually should be debated rather than somebody fired on. Right. So, I mean, how, how do we get here? <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, I mean, I hear these stories, I yeah, see them, so then, and I'm just like, well, how did, I, I mean, I get, you know, the culture wars or in societal kind of things, like whatever, like, but in academia, how yeah. did, how did we get here? So, I mean, I don't know that I have really an answer, but I, I would, I would peg it on two My, so I'm, I am now speaking mainly from my gut and personal experience, sure. a little bit from the data, and I'll try and distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. um, 
academia, so there's good data on this, academia has been skewing more and more left for a very long time. Right. So that, you know, by like the early 60s, it was probably about two thirds left and then the, you know, center and right was spread over the third mm -hmm. ballpark. And now in the social sciences and humanities, I mean, I'm not talking about the, I mean, okay, let's, let's back off on, on, on this matters on politicized topics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter, you know, if you're doing, you know, cosmic string theory, <laughs> right. Right? right, you know, and, and it, it probably doesn't matter if you're developing a vaccine either. Mm -hmm. It might matter if you're developing the behavioral interventions on how mo to most effectively distribute the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But it matters in the social sciences and the humanities, which deal a lot with politicized topics. But if you're doing, you know, the role of frequency of having sex in the maintenance of a long-term relationship, well, I don't know. Relationship that maybe that could get political. I was going to say that's probably not. <laughs> that probably could be political. That's probably a terrible example, actually. Right, right, right. So if you're, I, I don't know. But that's the problem is that like everything, oh, really, so many things can. Now, if you're doing the role of rods and cones in the in in the perception of shape, yeah, politicization probably is not going to matter. Right. That's probably not. Right. Okay. So. Um, so, but much of vast stretches, so, so I'm only talking about the social sciences and humanities, and it, and it really, the rubber hits the road when it deals with politicized topics. So they have, so they've gone from like two thirds left in the 60s to like 90 to 100% left now. Yep. And, and it's more extreme at the elite universities. Um, and that's important because they have outside influence. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is not to disparage like Kentucky State, but, you know, and, and occasionally there are very famous and influential people at these sort of small liberal arts colleges who end up having tremendous research careers. So it's not impossible. But in general, you know, it's the Harvard, Yale, Stanford's, Michigan's, Minnesota's, you know, it's like those places yeah. that lead the way that it's not just that they lead the way because those academics are usually highly productive. And so they're they're output is disproportionate. They also have very loud and large platforms. You know, they're invited to give keynote addresses and addresses to the major organization. And they kind of set the tone right. and the agenda for whole fields. Right. So, you know, it's easy to dismiss, ah, you know, who cares about the elite schools, except that, you know, where the elite schools go, pretty much everybody else follows. Mm -hmm. Maybe not literally everybody else, but but mm -hmm. like that's the direction of the field. So and and at those places, it's just it, it it's like virtually a hundred percent left. So and maybe not in all of them, but it, almost all of them. So okay. So why is that important? Well, just do the numbers, right? If 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 only I don't know six or eight or ten percent of Americans in surveys are far left in their politics, which is that's you know it's usually around eight or ten percent is what these surveys find. Right. If there is no one, so let's rough these numbers are not exactly right, but let's say the country is about a third left, about a third center, or about a third right. Mm -hmm. and maybe it's 40, 25, sure. 35, or something. But for, for the purpose of call it a third, a third, and a third, if academia is a is all left, just to make the it's not literally all left, but it's very, very close, it's gonna have three times as many. If there's nothing else involved, if they're just randomly selected from the third of the country that's left, they're going to be three times as many radicals in academia as there are everywhere else. And if that number is eight or 10 percent, you're going to have 25 to 30 percent of academia are radical extremists. Yeah. Uh, or at least in the social sciences and humanities. I think the numbers are not so extreme in other places. They're not just liberals. They're not just left. I'm talking Marx, self-described radicals, activists, and Marxists. Right. Yeah. And radicals, activists, Marxists, and extremists are going to be the most morally indignant, the most determined to change the world. Right. I mean, this is what extremists are all about. And in my experience, kind of sociopathological in how they go about doing it. Mm -hmm which means it doesn't really matter who gets hurt 
because they're, you know, it's a righteous cause. They're, right. they're on the right side of history. So, you know, if you're in the way, well, that's because you're, you, you know, you're just an evil sinner and you, you deserve excommunication. Right, right, right. So that's, that's a big part of it. It's just the, the extreme left. It's not that everyone in academia is extreme. I actually don't think that's true. It's not even that a majority is extreme. But the proportion of academics who are extreme or sort of these activists, kind of militants, is just from the numbers, is much, much higher than in the rest of the population. And especially with the advent of social media, it is far easier for them to coalesce into self-organizing groups to ostracize, denounce, and attempt to punish people they see as their enemies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think we need to have viewpoint diversity. I mean, I think that's super important. I mean, that's, we really need that. And so I guess, you know, again, I mean, what's the, what, what's, how do we fix it? I mean, how do we, <laughs> how do we move forward? What, what, what do you, what, what do you, uh, how can we at least get it more balanced? I would say, how do we get a little bit more sort of try to get it more neutral? How do, how do we do that? Um, I just, I, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, because it's all going in the opposite direction. So yeah. this is, you know, starting around 2011, 2012 or so, um, I became, uh, I, this issue of political bias and the sort of political skew of academia became one of my scholarly interests. Started writing about it, publishing it, about it, you know, the, uh, Tetlock and Height and a couple of other people and I have this fairly famous paper from like 2015 that documented some of these sort of political trends. Um, and, you know, around then Height organized Heterodox Academy. The right. mission is to advance viewpoint diversity within right. the academy. Um, and we were caught and, and, you know, that grew very fast from a handful of people to uh, thousands within a couple of years. So, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a time of some optimism that actually something constructive could be done about it. Right. That, you know, that goes from maybe, I don't know, 2013 or so to like 2016, 17, something like that. And uh, it just, I, I, you know, I mean, I love height and I'm glad Heterodox Academy exists. Yeah. Um, and and they, they are constructive, but they have not succeeded at doing anything to reverse any of this. Mm. So um, it, it has just gotten more extreme. Oh, you know, I, I don't think they've made things worse, but, you know, but it's gotten more extreme since Heterodox Academy came on through, which is one reason I can say, you know, I, which is why I now consider myself an activist, that it's yeah. like it, it, liberalism in the sense of individual human rights and free speech and free inquiry and academic freedom is not going to defend itself. Like I took it for granted for most of my career. Like it's so, so obvious that why we should have these things that it was beyond needing defense. What, why is this even an issue? But it obviously is, is an issue. And in the absence of a defense, it is going to die. Um, it is, it is under assault. And when something's under assault, it needs to be defended. So, you know, so now that doesn't really answer your question. Your question was how, you know, what do we do about this? And um, I don't really know. Uh, you know, I, I would say the, the, there's like, it's hard for me to separate out my predictions from what is going to happen from what I think the solutions are. So yeah. there are now groups popping up all over the place mm -hmm. to defend sort of the liberal order. You know what I'm calling the liberal order, the sort of human rights. This just new one came on, uh, came on. Well, I just found out about it like a couple of days ago. Fair, which stands. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, I about right. this. I'm, yeah. So, um, uh, foundation against intolerance and racism, mm -hmm. and what they mean by racism is, you know, the 
you know, the, 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 what, the, the type of racism that Jody Shaw complains about at Smith College, you mm -hmm. know, com being compelled to con confess that if you're white, you're an oppressor, you know, being compelled to confess, you know, that you're, you're complicit in white supremacy and all this sort of stuff, you know, whether you think you are or not. Right. So, um, so there's that. There are all these like petitions and statements now advocating academic freedom saying that people are committed to academic freedom. So the defense is mounting, and I think that's all fine and good, but I am actually not expecting it to change the long-term trends in the academy anytime soon. Hmm. That's a very sobering thought. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I just think it, I just think it means that, you know, people like yourself and, you know, many others have to keep trying to, you know, advocate for, you know, viewpoint diversity, sort of academic freedom, being able to do these things. And um, I think for folks that are in the academy and people that are doing research, that's, you know, when it comes close to home, yeah, you have to defend it. You got to support it. Say, look, we got to, we got to make sure we're able to do good research and, and, and good independent objective research. Yeah. The, the, th the thing is, you know, you, are, you're not likely to, uh, to understand the nature of the sort of left-wing authoritarian threats unless you cross them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're just quietly working in your lab doing something non-controversial, yeah. um, then, it, you know, unless you're purposely paying attention, there's, you know, you're not going to do your stuff and everything will be fine. And, um, and there's no reason you would even have any, um, there'd be no reason for you to even know this other stuff was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, unless you're paying close attention, which people have lots of other things to do, and I don't blame them for not paying attention. Right. So, and then, you know, the activists have been doing this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of the activism, I, I would trace it as coming out of postmodernism and this sort of wedding of postmodernism with kind of Marxist, mm -hmm. uh, certain Marxist ideas. Um, and so, that intellectual line of thought argues that what really matters are narratives, or like social and ideological narratives, narratives of oppression yeah. and superiority. Right. Um, and, and as a result, and they've been doing this for a very long time. I mean, Foucault was like in the 60s and 70s, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so that's like 50 years of people studying narratives. And they've gotten really good at narratives. Mm -hmm. They've gotten really good. So, so one of the narratives is that free speech and academic freedom is white supremacy. Right. So, you know, if you're a conventional lefty academic, the last thing you want to be called is a racist and white supremacist. <laughs> like, no, that's not me. And so you don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. Right. Right. So. It's so, so one, there's no reason to be paying attention unless you have reasons to be paying attention and lots of people aren't paying attention and that's fine. Um, and, uh, on top of that, even among people who are paying attention, they're vulnerable to being intimidated by this large cadre of activists right. um, who are ready, willing, and able to denounce them if they say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a report that just came out by Eric Kaufman, he's a UK political scientist, um, uh, that is consistent with other stuff that has also come out. We, we now have an epidemic of self-censorship. Uh, self mm -hmm. And when I say we, I mean the academy. Um, it is at unprecedented levels. It's also at, pre at unprecedented levels in the wider society. Yeah. Um, and while it is certainly good if that means people are less willing 
to publicly fling uh, um, racial and ethnic and gendered epithets and slurs, like that's a good thing. If that if there's less of that going on, it's like that's fine. Right. But to the extent that it has and is in the process of further impoverishing the free exchange of ideas and even the ability of social scientists to present evidence that contests activist narratives, then it's very, very dangerous. And it is probably ultimately more dangerous than the handful of people who are no longer flinging slurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. The irony in all this is, you know, you're saying this as a self-proclaimed liberal. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, right, well, I mean, partially it allows me to understand how liberals think, right? So, yeah, I mean, I do, I do get it. I mean, yeah. you don't want to be a racist. You don't want to be a racist. You want to be tarred as a racist. You right. have a reputation to get in. You know, like, and, and these things have a life or not. If enough people say you're a racist, well, then you're a racist. Like, yeah. and this is where the people who talk about, you know, this sort of Foucault, Marxist, critical theory stuff that emphasizes narratives as, you know, as social reality basically being the narratives that are, dominate a society, there's a lot of truth to that, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, again, it's like everything else, right? It's like, you know, it's where it goes. It's where it takes this life of its own. And it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's wild. Well, look, Lee, I mean, you, you, you were <laughs> super generous with your time. I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't thank you enough. I mean, we, 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 hit, we covered everything. The only thing we didn't cover is we didn't talk about our our mutual love for tennis. <laughs> oh, that's true. I forgot but, about that. But again, I don't I don't know if, if <laughs> listeners really want to hear us, you know, just geek out about <laughs> tennis stats from you know in the '90s and the '80s. And, but uh, I will gladly do that with you over a beer any day. Yeah, that sounds great. I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, look, um, tell listeners where they can where they can find you, um, whether your research or your work or online. Or, where's the appropriate oh, yeah, places well, to find you? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, if you're interested in my scholarly stuff, I mean, just go just on Rutgers. I mean, I'll pop right up and stuff. And um, I have a whole bunch of publications, most of which are the ones that I put up are not that technical. I think the lay intelligent person could mm -hmm. understand most of the publications I have on my Rutgers website. Uh, but they are, you know, they're academic publications. Then I blog at Psychology Today, and that's for everybody. Um, and then I have an active Twitter account. So the Twitter is PsychRabble. So the, the, the Psych Today account is, is Rabble Rouser, and the uh, Twitter account is Psych Rabble. So That's great. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff there. Yeah. Well, look, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on and, and uh, talking about all of this. It was so much fun. So yeah, I really, yeah, really great. thank it's you fun. for all your work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great. Yeah, of course. All right. 